The empire long divided must unite. Long united must divide. One of the most famous opening lines of any piece of literature. You know I must be talking about Luo Guangdong's 14th century epic, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Sanguo Yanyi. A romanticization of events that happened a millennia before the ink touched paper. It's a novel that tells the story of the late Han Empire and its downward spiral into the eponymous Three Kingdoms as warlords frantically try to claim their place in power and history. It's a story so complex, so interwoven with stories within stories, each with their own morality tale or food for thought, that the degradation that time usually forces upon anything, Three Kingdoms folklore still defies it. Passed down from generation to generation, school children across Asia are still widely taught their history and the fiction dramatized within its pages. While Western culture may only be vaguely aware of it, or not aware of it at all, The Three Kingdoms is only surpassed in modern day Asia by the journey to the West and its Monkey King. It's not a competition, but the fact that these ancient texts are still talked about, discussed, and used for entertainment in the 21st century is a testament to the influence that they have. Whether through stage plays, operas, shadow puppets, TV shows, movies, or video games, Romance of the Three Kingdoms is perhaps even more popular today than it was in 14th century China when it was written. If you know me, you may have watched a few videos where I've said that the Three Kingdoms period is very important to me on a personal level. It might be quite cheesy and melodramatic to say, but I would not be where I am in life without learning about the Three Kingdoms. And that's mostly down to the medium of video games. Let me tell you a quick story. You may have heard this before, but when I was a kid, a burgeoning teenager, I got my pocket money, took it to the local game shop in Meadowall Shopping Center, and, you know, browsing the game shelves, probably the bargain bin section for my latest pickup, something caught my eye. Wow, look at that cover. That looks badass. I am going to spend my 20 quid on this. And just as I always did on the bus ride home, I busted it open and started reading the manual. There was something kind of familiar about it, but I couldn't put my finger on what exactly, but it looked pretty cool. While I was mostly into JRPGs, some Chinese kick-ass action was sounding pretty tasty. Let my PlayStation 2 stretch its legs a bit. When I got home, I kind of loved it. I was quite overwhelmed. I mean, like, which character do I start with? I don't know, let's just do it. I genuinely don't remember which one I started with, but whether playing solo or co-op with a friend, I had a really great time with Dynasty Warriors 3. I loved the characters. I loved the events. Like, what an amazing story this was. So many perspectives, so many outcomes, but all with a solid backbone of a narrative. I fell in love with the inventiveness of all these unique and memorable playable warriors. And so, when I saw Dynasty Warriors 4 on the shelf not long afterwards, it had to be mine. And mine it was. It was more of the same, but with more characters. I was a little confused why they used the same characters again. I mean, why not make a new story? I didn't know, but it was all I needed. However, during my time playing DW4, I stumbled across a little menu in the back arse of nowhere pretty much, and Unfolded was the most mind-blowing event of my life. In this little menu option, something was revealed to me. The events of this game were real. Real historical events, real people that really lived and really did those things with a smattering of dramatization, of course. But these games were based on true events. This little part of the game gave a step-by-step -step reader's digest of the real McCoy, or maybe I should say the real Liu Bei, the real Cao Cao, and the real Sun Quan. I couldn't believe it. And not only was this video game series based upon it, but other games were too. Dynasty Tactics, Kesson 2, and most influential of all, the thousands of hours I put into Romance of the Three Kingdoms 8. And not only video games, but there's a book, an actual physical book that recounts the tales in more detail than you could imagine. And that book had to be mine. I had to get WH Smith's in Meadow Hall to order it for me because obviously they didn't have it in stock and costing me a princely 40 quid over two giant volumes, my mum thought I was nuts. What's wrong with an Alex Ryder book? Forget that James Ponce wannabe, The Three Kingdoms was mine. And I read and I read 
and I read and I fell more and more deeply in love with this slice of history meets fiction. And it was then I decided I wanted to go to China someday. One of those little dreams that you tell people that you want to do, but they don't really believe you. And to be honest, you don't believe yourself. You guys did not know me at that stage in my life. Like nobody who knew me would ever believe that I would have stepped foot on that plane to go to China by myself with like no money and nothing. But you know, I forced myself to do it. Leave my little England for a nice gap year in China. That was 11 years ago and I'm still here to this day. This is China right now. I got a girlfriend six years ago. We got married. Five years ago, I had a daughter and none of this would have happened were it not for this game. My life would be entirely different. Just think of the awesome man cave I could have built without them. Of course, I am joking, but I can't imagine my life any other way. How could I live without this nutcase in my life? She would literally not exist had I not picked up that game from that bargain shelf. It's funny how life can hinge on something seemingly so inconsequential. So that's why I love the Three Kingdoms era. And that's why I wanted to make a video about it. Almost as a thanks, I'm passing on the law around the world to future generations as though I'm coughing up some sort of lung virus, but more pleasant than that. And speaking of thanks, thank you to my Patreon supporters and producers who voted for this video project. I gave them a few options and this one tickled their fancy the most. So I hope I do it justice and I appreciate every single one of them. It is the best way to support me. I barely earn anything in terms of ad revenue with these videos, so they make it worth the effort. They get plenty of benefits and if you want to know more about it, stick around till about halfway when I'll let you know all the amazing things that they get or just click the link in the description to find out yourself. There have been many, many video games based on the Three Kingdoms period and even though I'm a guy known for my thoroughness, I mean, I play Kirby Slide, for God's sake. But for your sake, for my sake, for my YouTube analytics sake, I am not looking at all of them. Not only because many of them are lost to the anals of not being in English and being on an old ass console that I don't even know about them, but also because of similarity. I mean, as much as I could cover every single Dynasty Warriors game, not even the most boring of office job or night shift could compel anyone to watch all of that. Let's face it, I would be repeating myself. Same with Romance of the Three Kingdom strategy games. They are great. I love them, but I can only speak for so long about the same thing. So I am cherry picking a few entries that stand out to me. But we can't talk about the games before talking about two major aspects of the whole Three Kingdoms shebang. Firstly, what the hell is a story all about? If you don't know anything about the Three Kingdoms era, here's a little digest for you. In the second century AD, the Eastern Han Empire is in decline. The emperor has lost power, which is now wielded by meddling eunuchs. If you don't know what eunuchs are, they are essentially palace attendants whose balls have been cut off. And people wonder why they're always so angry and meddling all the time. I would crush an empire if someone even flicked my balls, never mind chopped them off. There's famine, there's disasters, and the public has lost faith. One of the biggest rebellions of all time, the Yellow Turban Rebels stood up and brought the country down to its knees. They were dispersed by Imperial troops, but the damage was done. Many warlords then vied for control of the land and the Emperor. One man called Liu Bei, a long distant relative of the Emperor, wants to restore the Empire to its former glory. Cao Cao, the son of an Imperial, sees the land for his taking and in the south, a young Sun Quan bides his time gaining huge influence in the region. After other warlords are eventually defeated, it's only these three that remain, creating three large kingdoms. Cao Cao in the north, the most powerful, Liu Bei, who was chased westwards, while the Sun family still held strong in the southeast. Eventually, the Han Empire was disposed by Cao Cao's son and claimed to be the new Cao Wei Empire. Not standing for that, Liu Bei declares himself emperor of the new Shu Han Empire. And Sun Quan, not wanting to feel left out, declares himself the emperor of the Wu. It was the TikTok fad of the time, okay? He was all about the clout and the viral hits. And so Wei, Shu and Wu comprised of the Three Kingdoms. After decades of skirmishes and stalemates, it was eventually the poison within that ended it. 
Cao Wei eventually defeated a hero Le Shu Han before the highly influential Sima family usurped power and declared a new empire, Jin, who would then go on to make a weakening Wu surrender. That is a very understated synopsis for a century of huge events that have gone down in folklore. Heroes on all sides fighting for their great leader to try and bring peace to the land by decimating an estimated 70% of the population. Imagine 70% of people that you know, gone might make the office worth going into every day. No one's stealing your milk in that fridge. And then we have to talk about a little company called Koei Tecmo. Originally Koei, before merging with Tecmo, were the premier developers of historical game simulators. From Nobunaga's ambition to Genghis Khan and Napoleon, they covered it all. Any famous eras or wars, they were there. But there was one era that has stuck with them and they have been the stalwarts of the Three Kingdoms era. Without Koei, Western knowledge of the era would be almost zero and no company has done more to promote and shall we say exploit the heroes and tales of Wei, Shu and Wu. While other companies have all had their goes at creating a gaming experience with Li Dian, Yan Yan, Huang Gai, only Koei can claim to have pretty much own the rights to it. Not legally, of course, but through sheer determination to milk this bad boy dry, you almost have to give them honourable copyrights. I'm sure Luo Guanzhong wouldn't mind. Just looking through Koei's back catalogue, you will see endless amounts of Three Kingdoms content, and I thank them ever so much for making so much awesome content for me, not only as a kid, but also to this day. They've chilled out slightly, more than likely due to huge development costs these days, but as a teenager, there would never be a week gone by when in IT class at school, I would check their website for the latest updates and announcements. They always had something coming, and I tell you, if Square Enix was my favorite developer, Koei would definitely second. They could do no wrong almost back in the day, and obviously I have immense emotional thanks to them because of what their games did to shape my life. So I still have a massive soft spot for them. So the majority of the games in this video are from them. In fact, I'm bunching all of their games together first because they are the most well known. So without further ado, let's jump into the three kingdoms in video games. And by that I don't mean games that were made during the Three Kingdoms period because that, that would be done. Perhaps the most famous Three Kingdoms video game, we have to start with Dynasty Warriors. Even if you don't know Dynasty Warriors, you know about Dynasty Warriors because even if you've never played a Dynasty Warriors game, you've probably played a Dynasty Warriors game, just disguised as another franchise. Hyrule Warriors, Fire Emblem Warriors, One Piece Warriors, whatever it's called, Anime du jour Warriors, it's everywhere. So you know about it, but what you may not know about it is that it wasn't always in the form that you know it for. Due to Western bastardization of the series naming, something which Koei is well known for, Dynasty Warriors was originally a 1v1 fighter like Tekken. This is the first Dynasty Warriors game, and it's only mildly interesting I suppose, Bit of a damp squib to start the show with, but just like Koei, you've got to start somewhere. It's a weapon based fighter which you would hope for, and if you were hoping for some immersive Three Kingdoms lore, then you're looking in the wrong place. I think Koei saw the massive success of Namco with their Tekken series on the PS1 and thought, yeah, I want some of that action. And they were the prime candidates to shove Three Kingdoms people into a tournament fighter world. There are 16 playable characters, so I'm reliably told, but two of them aren't even Three Kingdoms related. You have four characters per kingdom, plus Diao Chan and Lu Bu alongside two Japanese people. For the Shu Empire, you have who you'd expect, Guan Yu, Zhang Fei, Zhao Yun and the master strategist, often considered one of the most clever Chinese military minds of all time, Zhuge Liang. It is a bold move not to include Liu Bei himself, considering he's probably the main protagonist of the whole thing, but Wei has the one-eyed warrior, Xia Hou Dun, big baldy Dian Wei, and the most polygonal man in history, Xu Zhu. And you can also unlock the warlord, Cao Cao himself. He's the only actual leader that's repped in this game. Wu has the fire bros, Lu Xun and Zhou Yu. Sun Shang Xiang, the daughter of Sun Jian. Yeah, let's forget those important blokes in the family. You gotta have the feminine touch instead. 
And Taishu Tsu, who uh, is a guy that I like, but man, I'm not sure he deserved to be in this series so quickly. I mean, the dude barely did anything. In fact, I remember reading the book and he's hardly ever mentioned. Like, Alright, took out a few bandits. I do that every weekend, mate. I am crap at fighting games, which you may be aware of if you've been watching my Dreamcast series. It is a big thorn in my side. And yeah, I kind of find this game tough to master as well. It is a bit more accessible than your average SNK fighter though, thank god, and I could mostly get through the game with persistence rather than skill. You have two attack buttons, a slash and a thrust, which can be combined together with different inputs to create bigger combos. I was learning on the go here with this one, so excuse the poor efforts. Most of the time, I was just trying to figure out which buttons did what. But the other gimmick is the defensive play. You have two parry buttons, one for each of the two attacks. So you can press circle to parry the enemy's thrust and X to parry their slash. It's really tough to get a hang of. I feel like I need some sort of psychic foresight to know what they're gonna do. And in general, I'm not a big fan of defensive gameplay, so I did what I normally do and completely ignored it. Where's the rocket launcher? I'm pretty sure Zhuge Liang invented that. And if he didn't, can we really call him a legend? The gameplay is fine, I suppose. It's quite slow and methodical. You can get annihilated in an instant if the enemy gets the right kind of attack on you. But for me, it doesn't really stand out anywhere aside from the setting. It's kind of personality void. Games like Tekken had personality. This has got Lu Xun, who is essentially the boy in class who always answers the teacher's questions and carries a protractor in his pencil case. Just look at him. Most of the characters are quite bland. You can see the initial spark of where Koei want to take them later in the series, but right now they're just a bit too normal. Where's the dude with the leopard's head? Where's the kangaroo with the boxing gloves? We are in China, we can suplex a panda, right? Apparently not. The biggest downer on this game is the fighting arenas. I mean, they've got a few key locations and battles like Chibi, but oh my god, this is ancient China. Just think of the awesome visuals you could have. You could have a grand palace, a beautiful peach garden, but no, you're in a highly compressed JPEG. It looks awful. And I would recommend you don't play this game, even if you're a Three Kingdoms fan. This is the first time me playing it, and I've always been fascinated by it. It always seemed rather mysterious, mythical. I wanted to know where the series started. It's not like meeting your rock star, it's like meeting your rock star's dad who happens to be an accountant and likes caravanning holidays at the weekend. It's not really what you'd expect. Next up, we go to Dynasty Warriors 2, which is kind of a mistake. Not the game itself, the game is a lot of fun, but the Western marketing team kind of messed up here because in Japan, Dynasty Warriors 2 isn't actually considered Dynasty Warriors 2. It's almost like a spin-off of the fighting game. A bit of a breakdown. DW1 in Japan is called Sangoku Masu, literally Three Kingdoms Unrivaled, whereas DW2 is called Shin Sangoku Masu, meaning true Three Kingdoms Unrivaled. It's something different. It wasn't a sequel. Since then, things have gotten very confusing for gamers who like to cross continents because Dynasty Warriors 3 in Europe is actually Dynasty Warriors 2 in Japan. The latest mainline game, the much misaligned Dynasty Warriors 9 in Japan, it's called Dynasty Warriors 8, which is something different over here. It's mega confusing, but we are getting ahead of ourselves because we've got to talk about Dynasty Warriors 2. This is not a tournament fighter, but a 3D hack and slash that you all know about. Released super early in the PlayStation 2's life, Dynasty Warriors 2 was a great showcase for the system, going on a rampage, killing thousands of enemies in your path. At least that's what everyone remembers, but in actuality, DW2 is surprisingly quaint. While the amount of enemies killed is always being a selling point, it didn't get out of hand at this stage. But let me first explain. Booting up the game, you're greeted with a surprisingly subdued intro, which doesn't give the feel that the series has become known for with its cheesy, over-the-top homoeroticism blended with the finest cheese metal the world has ever seen. Thankfully, in the gameplay, the music is most definitely there. Admittedly, as a kid, I didn't really notice the music a whole lot. Only as I got older did I realize that, yeah, it's a bit cheesy, but it's also massively accomplished.
they do not hold back on the music in these games. Capturing the rocking energy while adding in classical Chinese instruments, it's genuinely impressive and great musicianship. I think these guys are often on par with Falcom at times for their great soundtracks. They definitely need more appreciation. So, you start off with a handful of warriors unlocked from the beginning, a few for each kingdom, three a pop, and you can choose which one to start with. Personally, for this playthrough, I started with Xiaohou Dun, because why not? He's only got one eye, he needs some representation. I actually almost said he needs more eyes on him, but I'm not sure that's acceptable as a mistaken insult these days. Each kingdom has five large battles to complete, although each kingdom only has one unique battlefield per run through. Everyone starts off during the Yellow Turban Rebellion. It's where almost every Three Kingdoms games begin. You're going to be hearing that a lot. It's everyone against the mythical forces of the magic laden rebels of Zhang Zhao and his two brothers. It's the perfect intro because it immediately gives a sense of scale for what to expect in these games. A huge battlefield filled with heroes from all corners of the land fighting one enemy who have numbers but lack skill. Yeah, let's begin the game not fighting against legendary heroes, let's fight against angry farmers because that's essentially what they are. You've got your chancers, you've got your ambitious magistrates, but 90% of them are just Jeff the Bricklayer who's absolutely sick to death of all the potholes being ignored. Where's my tax money going, Mr. Emperor? I don't know for sure, but the action in these games has, I would say, influenced countless action games that have come later. Maybe. I can't think of any early examples of the light attack, heavy attack combo. Here you press square to do a normal attack and triangle to do a heavy attack. But depending on how many squares you press before you do the heavy attack, it will change the combo outcome. In this first game of its kind, it's pretty limited. You can essentially do a maximum of three normal attacks before your combo ends. Not like later games where you can constantly upgrade the amount of combos you can do. Each stage has its end goal, which is almost always defeat the main enemy general and the defeat clause being one don't let your commander be defeated and two don't die yourself pretty obvious what i love about these early games is that it's most certainly not a walk in the park yeah you will be mowing down hundreds of enemies perhaps mowing is too strong of a word that makes it sound like painless and effortless it's more like something like trimming your nose hair you got to take your time with it. It's a task you got to work yourself up for. Even the privates aren't afraid to kick you in the privates. You can't be messing around and finding out. If you go charging too far ahead, you will get surrounded and you will get your ass kicked. You slowly make your way through the battlefield, doing the same kind of attacks over and over again. Which is where the complaint of repetition comes in, which I get this isn't for everyone, but as someone who does have the patience in certain situations, I find it really compelling. You're all always up against it and you don't feel like an absolute god, at least not yet. 1v1 it's not so bad taking on enemy generals but you're often swarmed by smaller grunts who will make it as difficult as possible for you to get your attacks in. The main mode is called the Masu mode and it's named after the special attack of sorts that you have. If you look under your health bar you can see another bar which is your Masu attack. Sadly, there's no mini bar for when things get really rough. When that's full, you can unleash it by holding the circle button. This gives you an almost unstoppable attack that's perfect for getting out of tricky situations or hopefully finishing off an enemy general, which you almost certainly want to because not only does it massively affect the morale of your teammates, but also you can improve the stats of your warrior because there are slight RPG elements in here. You can increase your defense and attack power by picking up swords and shields that are dropped. This is vital for getting far in the game because as I said, on the base difficulty, it can be tough and you may have to restart the whole campaign with your now slightly improved warrior. And hard mode is definitely off limits until you power up through normal mode at least one time. There is a tangible feeling of progression too. There are no overblown mechanics, no weapon upgrades, no equipment or skill trees. You're just getting stronger and I find that nicely simple. No faffage. You can't move for faffage in games these days, so this is really refreshing for me. Despite what the series is known for, the over-the-top badassery is kind of missing from this first entry. 
Cutscenes are highly minimalistic, and voice acting is only present in the tiny scenes between stages, which makes the story surprisingly impenetrable. Even with the brief narration you can listen to at the start of each stage, there's little to no flow, and that is entirely down to this game's biggest flaw, the lack of content. As I said, each kingdom has five battles, and no matter which character you pick, whether the starting ones or the unlockable ones, each character in a kingdom has the exact same campaign. It's the same five battles, which I guess if you're unfamiliar with the history, can't possibly cover what went on. And there are only eight unique battles in the entire game, which leaves a wafer thin explanation as to the epic events that unfolded. And also, it creates this weird anachronism, which the series is 100% guilty of, but never to this extent. I mean, why is Zhuge Liang fighting for Liu Bei in the Yellow Turban Rebellion? Why is Sun Quan there? Was he even born? Also, once you've beaten a campaign with a kingdom, what's the point in playing the same kingdom again with a different character? There's going to be nothing different at all aside from your play style. There are no bespoke campaigns. So, while it is cool to unlock characters by completing the game over and over again, that's not really enough of a reward. There's nothing different. So, DW2, while I love what it's going for and I like the gameplay a lot and its simplicity, it's just lacking in content to make it epic. You can definitely tell it was rushed to launch early for the PS2 because going back, I was astounded by the lack of content. Which brings me onto its sequel, Dynasty Warriors 3, which I don't want to get all melodramatic on you guys, but I have to say, this is how to perfect your product. This is one of the greatest games of all time. Because DW3 keeps the same core gameplay, the same feeling like you're a hero, but are definitely up against it early on, you feel like you're one man in a large war, and yet it ramps it up in every conceivable way without going too far. Dynasty Warriors 3 is where the badass over the topness comes to the forefront. There were whispers of it with the rocking music in DW2, but now it's truly coming into itself. This was my first Dynasty Warriors game, so I might be a little bit biased, but I find this just so perfect. And I'm saying this having not played it in about 20 years. It's got the perfect balance of what makes Dynasty Warriors so great. You're still doing the weak attack, strong attack combos, but they fixed the weaknesses and enhanced in all the right places. If your missus insists on going for a nip and tuck, you would hope that she goes for the DW3 route, not the Dynasty Warriors 6 route whose doctor got his medical certificate from a dodgy training center above a betting shop. Let's start with the characters. Additional characters, always a bonus, but as nice as it is to be able to play as new characters such as Zhang He, the fabulously Camp Wei General with his claws, Wei Yan, the fierce reckless Shu General, and even Sun Tzu, who I really can't even think why he wasn't in DW2. Seems like a strange oversight, but many things were overlooked in that game. However, despite the extra 13 characters, the greatest and most important aspect is that each and every character has their own bespoke campaign. That massively adds to the replayability, because while many stages are shared, and you'll be fighting across the same 20 stages, the fact that depending on which character you play as, you'll be seeing about 6 to 10 of those per run. You get a bigger sense of the story, all the threads eventually fit together as you play each and every one of them, and it rewards unlocking the characters, because you know they're going to be playing slightly differently. It's also much better with the time of characters placement in the story. Not perfectly because they definitely struggled to find where to stick Pang Tong in the situation and characters that came later down the line like Huang Zhong, they needed to fill out the stages. But for the most part, they did a good job of keeping the timeline slightly more authentic. And unlocking the characters is actually fun because some of them have puzzle-like elements to them that you need to figure out, like Pang Tong. I mentioned him already, he alongside Tai Shi Tzu are two characters that as a kid, I did not unlock until way later than everyone else since I didn't know what the trick was. Pang Tong is a bit more on the nose. See, historically, Pang Tong, who was a strategist thought to be only behind Zhuge Liang, died when Liu Bei was trying to invade modern day Sichuan. Both Cao Cao and Sun Quan both had solid territory, whereas Liu Bei didn't really have anything and was vulnerable. He reluctantly went to overthrow Liu Zhang, a distant relative who'd governed the region very peacefully. But anyways, it's this campaign that Pang Tong was killed. 
and he's very easy to be killed in this game too, like super quick. So if you want to unlock him as playable, you need to finish this stage without him dying, which basically means babysitting him the entire time. Tai Shi Tzu is a bit more complicated since you have to not fight him in the battle that you are supposed to fight him in. You're supposed to ignore him and go straight for their commander instead, which obviously never ringed with me as a kid. I mean, why would I not fight the guy who would probably decimate my forces if I did not fight the guy? There are a few like that which I appreciate, plus some more generic ones like completing the Masu mode with a certain character will unlock a specific character. If you play casually, you will eventually get most of them. I like this approach, it's such a good balance. And like I said, you will want to unlock them too because you'll have a slightly different campaign with each of them. It's a great feedback loop. And speaking of experience, of course, all the characters for the most part play differently from one another. They each have their own unique weapons and combos, and that's compounded by another obviously good feature of this game, Weapon Unlocks. Each character has four weapons, three of which are slight upgrades on each other that can be found in the battlefield or dropped by enemy generals. Usually the higher the difficulty of the battle or the setting that you're on, the rarer and more varied with stat boosts they may have. The fourth weapon is their legendary weapon of sorts and this can only be obtained on hard mode and if super special objectives are met in one specific mission. For example, Zhang Fei, most memorable feat in the Three Kingdoms is perhaps during Liu Bei's retreat at Changban. While Zhao Yun was busy picking up Liu Bei's baby, Zhang Fei was single-handedly holding back Cao Cao's army at the bridge. Well. If you want his fourth and final weapon, you kinda need to do that. Stop Xiaohou Yuan and Xiaohou Dun from crossing, and you do that, then a special unit will appear where you can go collect your special weapon. I love that aspect and trying to get every fourth weapon for every character was not only a good time sink for a teenager, but also fun and compelling to do. It was exciting figuring it out. Obviously I'm not showing it here because it's a commitment to even get one. You can't do it without your character being really strong, but I remember the feeling well. It adds another puzzle aspect to the game, more mystery, more intrigue. Every character has a unique event that they have to do. For me, Dynasty Warriors 3 is an almost perfect game in what it sets out to do. Sadly, it doesn't have anime babes in mech suits, but aside from that, it encapsulates everything that's worked for me in terms of what I've liked about the series as a whole, but all together in one. I do like other games in the series for the most part, but they each have their flaws that make me want to go back to 3 over and over again. It's feature perfect almost. There's no creep, no pressure to add new things or change things up, no gamifying every little aspect. It's pure and brilliant. It's not overly easy. You're not godly overpowered. You work for the reward and it has some of the best Worst voice acting in gaming history. I would say Dynasty Warriors 3 is one of my favorite games of all time and it should be one of yours too. And the funny thing is, I used to say the exact same thing about its sequel, DW4. I thought these two games, 3 and 4, were the Goldilocks thing, well, I don't know what the term is, but of the series. You know, they're not too hot, they're not too cold. The perfect temperature Dynasty Warriors games, but... It seems my memory is a little bit mistaken because DW4 almost is perfect, but only almost. There was a huge gap in my memory that really shocked me when I started playing it again. A huge gaping flaw that maybe I didn't realize was an issue back in the day, but it did sour this experience for me somewhat. Bespoke campaigns, they are gone. DW4 plays fantastically, but my word, do I not want to play the same campaign for each character. I'm not sure why they went this direction since you have a long ass campaign for each kingdom. Well, I say long ass, but it can be shortened because one of the compromises is that now you have options for each section of the campaign. For example, in the Yellow Turban Rebellion, the previous giant battle is now divided into three separate battles like it was in actual history. So you can take out Zhang Zhao's brothers before you take him on, and it does minimally affect the main battle. Or if you don't want to stretch that small more section out over three battles which does quite drag you can head straight into the main battle so you have options 
Between each fight, you can switch between characters in the kingdom and you gradually unlock more as you progress in the story, which Again, that is kind of boring. I like the special ways to unlock the characters in DW3. And gone are the weapon unlocks. You don't find weapons anymore. You just get XP for your current weapon. And it levels up, which makes it evolve. Which is, this that's boring. But they did keep the final weapon being a special unlock. So props for that. This is kind of heartbreaking guys because I don't remember any of this it's like finding out your mate at school was in fact a bit of a prick but you didn't realize until just now when you see him on Facebook making the same shit comments that he used to but you know what as much as I think DW3 got every part of its gameplay perfect and I don't like the direction the series was going in here DW4 uh, it plays so good still it's smooth it's pick up and play Maybe a little bit too easy for my liking, but I guess that's the balance they needed when switching characters mid-campaign. It just feels really good. The battle scenarios flow well too. The map and announcements, they actually stay up to date. The cutscenes, seamless. It's just incredibly solid with a great cast of characters. They only added three more, which is minor, but they got a couple of important people in there with Cao Zhen, who was pretty much in every battle ever, and Cao Cao's cousin. He should have been there like much earlier. Wu got Zhou Tai, he's just badass. They definitely nailed his design. But to be honest, I don't have as much incentive to play as these guys as I would if they were in DW3 with their own bespoke campaigns. So yeah, moving on quickly to DW5, which was the last one that I played, at least at launch, buying it day one and still being goddamn excited for it. I mean, I literally check Koei's website daily for news. I was still stoked about DW5. My childhood self didn't realize that I turned into a stubborn, miserable git 15 years later. And, well, uh, I didn't play it that much. It was at a period of my life when I finally had friends to hang around with properly. I was playing the guitar, I was in a band, I was skipping PE because goddamn who wants to play badminton when you're 15? What a fool I was! Badminton's awesome. If I could go back in the past, I would slap myself and say, Jordan, play more badminton. And also play more Dynasty Warriors 5. Oh my god, they reverted almost everything about 4 back to the style of 3. Every character has their own bespoke campaign, around 5 to 8 battles long, and they are mostly chronologically correct. This is the best they've been in the series. They even stop where the character actually dies for real. Like, you won't see Guan Yu at Wuzhang Plains, and even more interestingly, if you control someone who didn't always play on the side that they're mostly affiliated with, then that's still represented here, like Zhang Liao. Pretty badass dude, one of Wei's best. Well, he was working for Dong Zhuo against the Coalition, and then for Liu Bu against Liu Bei before joining Cao Cao. And in actuality, in this game, he only has two battles while he's in Cao Cao's army, which is kind of weird. So, yeah, I mean, it could be a disappointing aspect if looked at a different angle. Like, Zhou Yu dies not long after Chi Bi. And so, yeah, that's the end of his story. It's really surprising how restrained they've been here. In 3, they had a really nice mix of historical and fictional events where, sure, there's no way Sun Jian would be at Yiling, the battle that pretty much sent Liu Bei to an early grave, but you know what? Let's fantasize a little bit. DW5 is a history fascist and would lock you up in a re-education camp if you dare suggest Jiang Wei was at the Yellow Turban Rebellion. But just like every contradictory prick, it does slip up here and there, if only to make some characters actually viable for more than one fight. Like Dian Wei was one of the earliest officers to die in the entire Dynasty Warriors roster. I'm not sure why he's in the series to be honest, but yeah, they needed him to be in at least more than two battles, so they did plonk him here and there where he shouldn't belong. And although I didn't play DW5, anywhere near as much as the previous two entries because you know, I was outgrowing them, I think DW5 could take the crown as being a pinnacle of the series. But I do think the main issue is that it is a little bit too easy. The easy creep is starting to show a little bit here. In 2 and 3, every enemy needed to be dealt with carefully. Now they are starting to be made of paper, which for me 
is less interesting. The generals still provide a challenge though, but it is less satisfying overall, even if all the other elements are there. And it's also starting to creep in this nonsense of your entire army being incompetent, having to go everywhere to rescue everyone. That's where the difficulty is here. Yeah, the peons are really weak, but you'll be running around all over the place. And if you don't, you're going to lose the battle because your idiot allies will probably die. Dynasty Warriors 6 is perhaps one of the biggest downgrades in gaming history. And it is at this point, even just in the run up to release, I knew my time was perhaps up with the franchise. Many would say that's fatigue with playing similar games constantly, plus their expansions, which I'm not going into, although you should. And that is partially correct, but there's no debating the fact that Dynasty Warriors 6 was a pile of misery, a victim of HD, of increasing gaming horsepower that developers, especially in Japan, were struggling to adapt to. Where Western developers just threw more team members onto projects, more manpower, more money, I think Japanese developers, aside from a few major exceptions, still tried to keep it real, and even still do to this day, far more sustainable. But in the early Xbox 360 and PS3 era, developers really, really struggled, and DW6 was one of the major victims. Which is quite ironic considering how Dynasty Warriors 2 was a showpiece for what the PS2 was capable of. DW6 was a showpiece for how much more expensive games were to make and how it could crush those who weren't ready to spend the resources. Just for the record, however, I am playing the PS2 version, which did come out a bit later because it's easier to record. But I did play the original HD version as a teenager eventually, definitely not on day one because I knew it wouldn't be a particularly joyous experience. It's never a good sign when the roster of the game gets cut down. Yeah, this PS2 version has more characters, but the base game has 41, which is 7 less than the previous game. It has all the appeal of a depressed donkey. You ain't riding it into battle. And yes, I did get the game eventually, and unsurprisingly, I barely played it. It was a case of diminishing returns for the series. I played 3 the most then four, then five, just a little bit less, but six, that was the jumping off point. That diving board on the Grand Canyon that franchises jumped to their death. Yeah, the six was kind of it for me. I hadn't fallen out of love with the Three Kingdoms history, far from it, but Dynasty Warriors had had its time. The greatest offense is that the majority of the characters don't even have a Masu mode. They aren't even involved in the story. You have a wealth of characters and only a third of them can be played in the campaign mode. The others, mostly through Koei's gritted teeth, could only be used in free play mode, which, yeah, I'll fully admit, I did get a few kicks out of this mode, randomly playing as Jurong at the Battle of Guandu, why not? But to relegate the majority of the cast to this, that's borderline shameful. They must have been embarrassed about this because for the PS2 release, a year later, they added a few more with the Masu mode. If it was this troublesome, why didn't they just do a DW4 and have one long campaign for each kingdom? It boggles my mind. I wouldn't have liked it, but it's definitely the lesser of two evils. My guess is because I believe each Masu mode has special CGI cutscenes for each character, which is more work. 3 and 5 had shared cutscenes for each battle rather than each character. We're in HD, ladies and gentlemen. They just can't afford it. And worst of all, the character designs. Whoever was Koei's designer at this point, they must have been thinking, you know what this series needs? More hair. Make everything hairier. Talk about jumping the shark. 90% of the characters are completely overly designed. Like they've got way too much going on and it's like they wanted to fuse anime with realism and created a monstrosity. I absolutely can't bear how the characters look in this game. More bristly, more wild and dumb and over the top. And it's even funnier when you get to like the three or four characters that aren't overly designed for some reason and they stick out even more because now they look like somebody's first fan art that they stuck on DeviantArt. They also changed up a lot of their signature weapons, which I get, they perhaps thought it was getting stale and predictable. And even though I don't really like it, if I was in charge, I'd have probably thought, you know, I need to do that too. Keep things fresh. Bye bye to Jong He's claws, he's now got a spear. Gan Ning's big pirate sword, well now he's got two daggers. Playing the PS2 version for this video, yeah, it kind of shouldn't have released in this state. But you know what? 
It plays just as fun, even if it's missing a lot of what I love about the series. Although the enemies have truly become paper now. And I did notice that in both DW5 and this, there is another direction I did not like where this series was going in. And that is the incompetency of your allies. Now you always have to help them out. You're always having to go back to your main base, no matter what, or your commander will be defeated. Your allies can't make progress by themselves. You have to do everything for them. And you know what's not fun? Endlessly running across a giant battlefield, constantly having to fight other people's fires. And that's kind of where I'm going to leave the main series because this seems to be a running theme. We're up to 9 now, which I haven't played and I have no intention of doing so. But DW8, especially the Extreme Legends version, is considered awesome by most people. But it again does things that I don't like. One large campaign for each kingdom, no bespoke campaigns for each character. You also immediately feel like a god just plowing through straw men. If you like that then fine, but for me, I enjoyed being up against real soldiers. And I think I can confidently say that overall, Dynasty Warriors is not as good as it used to be. The gameplay is essentially the same, but they've had to gamify, simplify and focus on the wrong aspects for me. They had something perfect, but were forced to chase the mass appeal. I mean, just look at the difference between 2 and 8 when playing for the first time. What's the difference that you'll notice? Just look how brutal you start on the newer games. Look how even the standard soldiers in the older games need to be considered and you need to take your time to fight against them. In the classic games you are not immediately overpowered. In fact, even the basic soldiers can put up a fight. And the enemy generals, well they can be bloody terrifying. The modern games, well you can just play with one hand and make a cup of tea with the other. Koei believed the greatest thrill of the series was in the death count. How many people can you kill? And that is partially correct, but there is a point where the numbers rising starts to lose any meaning. When you reached 100 in the earlier titles, it felt like an accomplishment. In the later titles, it was, well for you, it just was a Tuesday. Nothing special about it. You get a thousand kills on almost every level. But in the earlier ones, it was only really a select few. Hulao Gate and perhaps the final battles at Wudang Plains and the like, you felt super special and accomplished. And when an allied general states that you are a true hero of the Three Kingdoms, you goddamn felt like you did something goddamn heroic. You fought for it every step of the way. And this unlimited godly powers of the later games leads into another issue. The issue is that it's all about you. You are the center of this universe and you are the only competent general on the field who can actually do anything. Everything revolves around you and you trying to solve everyone's incompetence. Although I'm sure many of you feel the same way about your day job. And if you don't, then you're probably one of those incompetent people. You're running all over the map like some comedy routine. I feel like adding the Benny Hill music again. It's like playing Overcooked by yourself. It's just you versus the entire enemy army. Your allies don't do anything, or at least it feels like it. However, in the earlier titles, it felt like you were part of some grand battle. A smaller cog in a larger machine. You could influence the tide of battle, of course, but it felt as though you had real allies who actually did something. You wanted to help them because you knew they would help you too, or help the battle as a whole. It's not all about you, but you being a hero amongst heroes. They actually do something, they accomplish stuff by themselves, and it's not set in stone. Sometimes they would do it, sometimes they would fail, and you could give them the push to succeed. Everything felt really connected, as though events actually mattered. This is completely lost in the modern era where the battle itself, the location and story behind it, it's all outshone by the fact that you're running around murdering endless foes and it's only you that's doing it. Remember when getting a weapon was meaningful? Yeah, early games weapons had meaning. They weren't easy to come by and you felt rewarded and massively grateful when you found a slight upgrade. There were no endless streams of the same shite. And getting their ultra weapons was a huge amount of fun. A lot of mystery behind them. That mystery has gone. The characters actually felt like characters with meaning because they were all unique in almost every way. I understand that as development goes on and you have the pressure to add a dozen new characters each time, there's almost no chance of keeping up. But that doesn't mean it's not a fatal flaw. DW3 and 5 Every single character had their own bespoke story mode. 
Of course, the battles are reused, but the order in which they are played, and even some having unique circumstances, can be quite different. You really got to know each and every character. You got to understand their impact on the events in the story. Of course, many of their appearances are fictionalized, but that's not the point. The point is, the characters had meaning. The modern way of making you go through Kingdom storyline, rather than choosing individuals, is frankly rubbish. Why can't you have smaller bespoke stories for each character? It makes replayability way more interesting and it has far more interesting pick up and play loop to it. It's even more laughable that many characters are only available during free play mode. What's the point? Of course, there may be people out there who think I'm mad or think I've got some rose tinted glasses on. Mad? Maybe? Rose tinted glasses? Well, I played a lot of them about five minutes ago and I feel even more strongly now compared to when I did before. And if you enjoy just mindlessly plowing through enemies, then you know all the power to you. But I genuinely miss the days when it was quainter, when you weren't immediately a god, when you had to really work for your meal and you felt like you were part of something bigger. The only thing bigger in the newer games is the ego of the main character. I have no idea what Koei are doing with the franchise these days. DW9 and its spin-off Empires, they landed like a wet fart in a bath after a particularly dodgy taco. Koei, I implore you, Hire me. Hire me as the producer on the next Dynasty Warriors game, and I promise you, it will be awesome. And I'll also make Liao Hua a playable character. He'd be unlocked from the beginning. He'd be the strongest, cleverest, most badass person, warrior person in the game, and he would look like me. Now, while most of you guys will be familiar with Dynasty Warriors on home consoles, Koei were certainly partial to giving watered-down versions on portable systems, at least when the hardware allowed it and even when it really shouldn't allow it. Just very briefly on this, during my research I was really surprised to learn of Dynasty Warriors Advance, a DW game on the Game Boy Advance. Those madmen! I was expecting one of those really commendable but often rubbish 3D attempts on the system, but no, they saw the sensible option and made it a top-down action game that's heavily customized for the system, shall we say. This is not great, but I like the ideas in it. So there are only like 13 characters in it or something, and nine of them are unlocked at the beginning, three for each kingdom. The battles flow completely differently, and it gives an air of strategy to proceedings. The battle map is divided into segments, and you, your allies, and the enemy take their turns to move on it. If you clash with a group of soldiers, a battle will commence in that segment. You can see they try to implement the mechanics of the main series as much as possible with the fighting, but it looks very rudimentary in comparison. It's like a simple beat em up with crowd control. The enemies take forever to take down, even the grunt soldiers, which works well in the big games, but on the Game Boy Advance, no, you want pick up and play games. Hulao Gate, the first level for shoot, oh my god, it takes absolutely forever. Everything is just so painfully slow about this game. Which is a shame because it's got some great ideas like skipping a turn to search an area for items and health boosts or a new weapon. You can escape battles between actual generals who will then follow you and then you can use your allies to attack them instead, kind of like an ambush. It's just so bloody slow. The first level felt like an hour or something. And I know it's Hulao Gate which is generally one of the longest in the series but I found it exhausting, especially since the combat and exploration isn't anywhere near as close to being interesting enough. Maybe if I had literally nothing else to play, then sure, it's distracting. You know, I'm in a car ride going to Skegness, I'm all pokemon out, so why not button mash with this game? But it's not a good game. It needed to be twice as fast, and you know, then we could have talked. And the critics felt the same way, it seems. And I think that's down to one main issue, the fact that a 3D game already released on a portable system before this one. Because in 2004 in Japan, on the PSP, and very quickly the rest of the world, Dynasty Warriors on the PlayStation Portable was born. And it was, for all intents and purposes, a proper Dynasty Warriors game. In fact, I had this. I don't know if I bought it alongside my PSP or a bit later on, but sure as hell you can imagine my 14 year old mind blown as I had Dynasty Warriors in the palm of my hands. Oh my god, it's in my hands, this is like insane, it's amazing. I mean, it's not amazing, but it's also amazing, if you get what I mean. Imagine this, and Wipeout, and the Power Stone collection, the PSP was just unbelievable for the time. 
And one of my strongest memories when I was doing my A-levels is that I was so poor. I had literally no money. I didn't have enough money to even get the bus to go to school. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to trade in my PSP and what few games I had left. I went into the local pawn shop. I had Loco Roco, Dynasty Warriors, and Power Stone Collection. And the bloke behind the counter said, Yeah, they're just not very good games, are they? Can't give you that much money. Not very... Excuse me, good sir. We need to step outside. You can't tell me what's a good game or not if you've only got three teeth. You are not an authority. This was followed a couple of years later with Volume 2, which I didn't get. And even then they weren't done because we got Strike Force in 2009. This was also on home consoles as well. I would never played this one either, but booting up the PSP version, I mean an instant wave of dislike came over me because it's based on the DW6 character designs and they are just all kinds of awful. That's a lot of Dynasty Warriors, but before we move on to other Three Kingdoms video game related stuff, if you've watched this far, you'll probably enjoy it, right? So if you do, just do me a favor, just click that like button, okay? Just click it, please. It really it helps, okay? And maybe even subscribe if you want more stuff from me. If you're new here, I do these long video game retrospectives, hours long. I also dabble in videos for physical game collectors. And every Friday, you can join me in my adventure to completing every Dreamcast game. Every single one of them. Their videos like this, just shorter. And nothing Three Kingdoms related because they weren't translated. Yet, go check them out. As a fan of Dynasty Warriors, it was only natural that I happened upon a new Koei franchise that carried a similar name. Another one inspired by the Three Kingdoms era, this time another strategy game. And one that became one of my favourites of all time, Dynasty Tactics. This is what happens when you mix Dynasty Warriors with Final Fantasy Tactics. This is not a kingdom simulation game like with Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it's pure turn-based strategy battles and I love it. I love Final Fantasy Tactics on the PS1, so this, this was a dream come true. Nobody ever talked about Dynasty Tactics back in the day, and nobody talks about it now, but let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the best PlayStation 2 games. This is one of the best games on the system. When planning this video, I was a little bit worried about approaching Dynasty Tactics because it's one of those games that I have very fond memories of, but maybe it was just my nostalgia and I didn't want to ruin my childhood by playing it again. But no, I was right then and I'm right now. Dynasty Tactics is an incredible game. And I plan to play this just for a couple of hours, just for this video, capture some footage, refresh my memory, but oh my God, it almost derailed the entire project because I could not pull myself away from this game. It's one of the most addictive strategy games ever made, at least that I've played. Why? Well, let's start with the premise. For a start, there are three story campaigns. You can choose Liu Bei, Sun Quan, or Cao Cao. That's three full campaigns, and not only that, but each of these campaigns have branching paths. At various points in the story, you have a choice of what you want to do. For example, do you want to ally with Lu Bu or fight against him? Do you want to only defend the Jing territory or do you want to go on the counter offensive? These have huge ramifications in terms of storytelling that actually makes it one of the worst renditions of the Three Kingdoms story and history and becomes more like fan fiction, like almost immediately. And I love it. How can Koei keep selling the same story over and over again? Well, they just change it. And yeah, Dynasty Warriors does this too, but at least aside from the endings, it keeps it on the rails and to be within the framework of the Three Kingdoms itself, whereas Dynasty Tactics is like, yeah, let's have Lu Bu kill Liu Biao and take over Jing province. Why not? For those not familiar, Lu Bu was long executed by Cao Cao at this point. He did not come close to Liu Biao. Almost every chapter of this game has you making choices. The amount of replayability in this game is insane. Like three campaigns, each with wildly different forks in the road almost every turn, it's brilliant. And you may have noticed that it's not entirely battles. You'll see that there is a kingdom map which is new to down compared to something like Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Here you can form your armies, create envoys, dispatch diplomats, try to recruit free officers and such. While I massively appreciate this being here as it really sells the whole forks in the road thing, as you visibly see how the map is developing or how other forces have changed and stuff, it does feel quite restrictive. 
You don't have massive amounts of freedom to do what you want. You generally have to keep within the realms of the immediate task at hand and narrative. Like when Liu Bei is in Jing and he's fending off Cao Cao's forces, you can't march a secondary army into Chengdu. But you can go to the south and take down some of the smaller warlords, which is handy if you want Wei Yan and Huang Zhong. That's one of the few times you're allowed to expand outside the current goal. You can go capture some free cities, maybe take down some smaller forces, but you can't go full maverick, especially if there's something story related coming later on. Like Han Zhong was there for the taking, but capturing that city is a plot point later in the game, so you can't take it too early. So it's not a free-for-all like Romance of the Three Kingdom strategy games, you have to follow the insane narratives with only a smidge of freedom. Some other aspects feel undercooked as well, like diplomats. You can make allegiances with other forces, but it's almost never allowed because it doesn't fit with what the game wants you to do, and there's never enough forces to do so anyway. So, if you like freedom, this section of the game may annoy you a little bit, but it does have its uses, like for example recruiting free officers. You'll see little white arrows on cities where there are free officers to hire. You can hire anyone you want, but there is one requirement you need to check who they are friends with. You can see this in their bio, and you need to send someone who is a known friend of theirs, otherwise they cannot be hired. This can be tough for some of them. For example, Gan Ning was sitting there in Jing province the entire game because Sun Quan didn't hire him, and I didn't have anyone who was friendly with him. That's just a big tease, one of the best generals in the game, and he's just sitting on his ass the entire time. You can form your armies here as well, and only certain officers qualify to be the leader of the army. Your classic famous generals like Guan Yu, Zhang Liao, the big names, only they can form armies. Sadly, my man Liao Hua isn't deemed legendary enough. You are in my heart, bro. Once you've got a leader, you have to appoint one strategist. You can appoint anyone, even if they're dumb. Yeah, you can have a borderline moron as your strategist. They do have a purpose, but I'm not 100% sure if it matters a whole lot if they're clever, but whatever. And after that, you can appoint two lieutenants. In this game, if you play like me, you will get a lot of officers in your kingdom. Too many. You can't form an unlimited amount of armies, however. The amount is limited to how many cities you have occupied. Basically, the bigger your kingdom, the more armies you can have, which makes sense because each officer has a number of troops attached to them. You can't have like one city and 20 armies with four officers each, the troop numbers would not make sense. And your generals level up by performing deeds in battle. Each level up they get not only do their stats increase, but also their troop numbers which ends up having a slight issue with the fact that you're rewarded for using the same generals over and over again, and most of your eligible officers get left in the dust because their 3,000 troops won't stand a chance against the increasing enemy hordes. But enough about that because I need to talk about the best thing about Dynasty Tactics, the battles themselves. As you send your armies onwards, they will inevitably clash with the enemy forces. It doesn't matter how many armies you have planted on one location, only two of them will be able to take part in a battle. So that's eight officers in total on your side, eight on theirs. But you may have been to school and noticed that some battles have ten. Well, that's because of a cool thing called spies. You can create an envoy who has a spy ability, and if you send them alongside your army, they can join the battle too. Only two of them, but that's quite significant and very important because even though they generally aren't the strongest of generals, in fact most of them look like they'd keel over with a light breeze, but they have special abilities such as building structures like towers or camps in advance of your arrival. They can also quickly destroy enemy structures in one turn rather than two, and they can even climb castle walls. They add a lot to the game. So if things are getting epic, you should be having 10v10 battles. On the grid, the troops are shown generically to match their troop types. You have foot soldiers, cavalry, archers, alongside different varieties of those. Turns are based on morale. The more morale a unit has, the sooner he will act in a round. This is brilliant because I love tactics games that are based on speed rather than the Fire Emblem approach where it's all your units first, then all the enemy units. This is just better. And it's even better than Final Fantasy Tactics because this is so dynamic. Everyone's morale is up and down all the time. 
Certain tactics, which are a special move, can lower the enemy's morale. In fact, one can even improve the enemy's morale as a negative side effect. You can increase your own troops' morale by using dedicated tactics or some as a side effect. It's so visceral and keeps you on your toes at all times. You can use normal attacks on enemies and the clash will result in casualties on both sides. If you do it head on, you might even lose more than them depending on your current situation. But attacking from the sides or behind, that's much better. That will increase your morale and decrease the enemies. But the main thing you want to be using are the tactics. These are special attacks that each officer has. There's a huge variety of them. Some are pure power assaults, some are more snidey, some are more supportive. And each general will increase their pool of tactics as they level up. You know that Guan Yu is going to be all killer, while Duga Liang is going to be more strategic. And the genius idea of Dynasty Tactics is to combine your tactics together to create a power domino effect that will devastate multiple enemy units at once. Combos in this game are vital and genius, and I absolutely love it. It's hard for me to explain in words and to not try to bore you to death, but if on the unit's info screen, you can, you can see the list of tactics that are currently available for that unit. You can scroll through them using the circle button. And the one at the top is the one that's going to be used if any combo opportunities pop up. For example, a simple, unambitious one. Give you an example, okay? Here you can see Huang Zhong. He's got a variety of tactics, but the one that's viable right now is ambush. So let's put that in the primary position. Next, you can see Guan Suo. He has two tactics viable, but the one I want now is flank because that suits the combo better. Currently, I am controlling Zhang Fei, who can use revive. Using revive will swing Guan Suo into action to initiate his flank. Because he attacked Deng Ai, who else is currently set up? Huang Dong follows up to do his ambush. This is as basic as they come. That's just one simple example. But extrapolating that into a full battlefield, having 10 units ready to go, you have the potential to create a 10 combo attack. I don't know if I ever did that back in the day, but replaying it for this video, I did manage a 9 combo. Using a mixture of pure brutal attacks, supporting attacks, morale boosts, you can create something truly epic and way over the top. Strategists can have a massive part in this as well, as they can link tactics that aren't really connected to the one that you're pulling off. They can be at the other side of the map, link an enemy which freezes them in place. But if a tactic is used elsewhere, then that will activate your strategist one too. So they can join in, even if they're nowhere near the main action. Or they can set off their own chain of events. So much thought can be put into this. It's massively addictive trying to work out how to bring on the most pain to some poor sod. Why would you want to do this? Well, aside from the military benefit of annihilating an enemy, the pure satisfaction of being clever enough to pull it off, there is one reason above all. Capturing the enemy general. Yeah, depending on which general you've just taken out, the higher the combo, the higher the chance of you capturing him. And if you capture him, he will join your force. Not every general, like obviously the leader or some generals who have a big part to play in the story, like Sima Yi, they won't join you. But I would say like 90% of the generals in battle, you can capture and take for yourself, which has insane ramifications for some campaigns. Like in my Liu Bei's campaign, I had Zhang Liao, Xu Huang and Xu Zhu all on my team fighting against the forces of Cao Cao. Like Zhang Liao never even joined Cao Cao's forces in my campaign because I captured him when he was with Lu Bu. I even had half of Cao Cao's family on my side. Like this is amazing because it's literally like puzzling crack in video game form. You want to capture as many enemy generals as possible and add them to your team. Even if you're not going to use them. You want to deny your enemy from using them, which puts you at a massive advantage. Like imagine Cao Cao's kingdom without the aforementioned generals. I'd have captured Xia Hu Dun and Yuan multiple times over as well, but the game decided that they were too vital to be captured. I even captured Zhao Yun from Cao Cao, who in my fork in the road never actually joined Liu Bei naturally. I tell you, this 
has a feeling of Pokemon. You want to catch them all. And there are 255 generals in the game. And the fact that you can unlock their bios once you hire them, either by finding them free or capturing them, means there's definitely an element of trying to get them all. You're filling out your Pokédex. Some are not easy to get and you only have small opportunities to get them. So you really have to be clever about this. You do need patience though, because making sure the stars align for the right combo isn't for those who are eager to win. Sometimes you gotta take a few more hits than you'd like before things start really lining up for you. Yeah, you could take a three here, but that's not enough. Maybe I'll pass a turn to see if things look better. Dynasty Tactics isn't a strategy game, it's a puzzle game. It's a game of Sudoku, but with three kingdoms characters and a storyline, it's about finding the best logical answers. It's about setting up the best combinations possible. Like I could stare at one move for like 10-15 minutes, and yet it would feel like seconds. And then, when you pull off a 9 combo move, it's actually better than sex. Especially when you capture a badass general in the process. Sometimes it doesn't work out, sometimes there's a spanner in the combo works that I didn't take into account, like some prick far away who's got a volley of arrows ready that I didn't notice and he pushes the target into a place I didn't want, or maybe I forgot to make sure everyone's tactic is set to the correct one, or maybe I forgot that this tactic makes this enemy face this direction, meaning one of the planned combos didn't activate because it's now facing the wrong way, ah oh, bloody hell. But saying that, this piece of brilliance in design also makes the game quite easy on the whole. Now don't get me wrong, the enemy can be vindictive little shits if they want to be, but because if you play like me and you want to capture every officer, you can dwindle your enemy forces down to a few C tier generals that they only use in an emergency. In fact, the game often chooses to use better generals who still haven't fully recovered from a previous defeat. So they start with like 1000 troops or something, like it's desperation. So it can be quite easy in that sense. Thinking, planning, and executing massive combos is not easy, however. I feel like a chess god, only slightly more nerdy somehow. So yeah, dwindled enemy forces can be an issue, because if you play as obsessively as I do, you do kind of break the game. Now, I'm not one of those weird people who comment on how broken games are, but only after reading online about some super obscure setup that no one would ever try unless they were really attempting to break the game. Yeah, you just have to go to this location, pick up this weapon, grind for four hours, pick up 99 gemstones, attach it to your sword, talk to this old git, fight the super weapon, get the ultra magic, attach it to your sword. And then the game is a joke. It makes me absolutely sick to my soul stomach. No, I'm not saying the game is broken, it's just the game that can be exploited. But that's honestly what makes it so fun to play. Planning out these crazy attacks never gets old. It's just nice, there's a big story, loads of battles, three campaigns to do, all with forks in the road. It is utterly brilliant. Dynasty Tactics is a brilliant game. It's not perfect, but it is one of my favourite games of all time. And I love it even more now than I think I did back in the day. The only thing I would change is having a smidge more freedom in terms of goals. Going rogue should be a little bit more doable. Also, I would change some of the character renders. I mean, while some of them fit with the Dynasty Warriors looks that we've seen, some of them are just awful. Like why? Why did they make Liao Hua look like a used car salesman who's been thrown in the loony bin? I wouldn't have minded if they just reused some hand-drawn portraits from the Three Kingdoms games. It just looks cheap here. Aside from that, I think the visuals are very good. Seeing the tactics play out is fun, hearing the cheesy, poorly delivered lines from the voice actors does not get old, and when things get badass like the general going on an unexpected rampage, it's awesome. Have you learned your lesson yet? The music is also ingrained in my head. Hearing it again for the first time in like 15 years, uh, it almost made me cry. As you may be able to tell, I think Dynasty Tactics is a criminally underrated game. Some people may say it's a broken game. I say, you're a broken person. Because it's just so much fun, so addictive, so cerebral, that I think even the developers made it by mistake. 
They just had some random ingredients they thought would be cool, melded them together and somehow they created gold. For me, it's one of the quintessential Three Kingdoms games. It's genuinely one of the best of its kind, one of the best tactical RPGs on the PS2 and it should be in your collection. Maybe without all the Three Kingdoms personas and themes it may not have been as addictive, but treating these historical figures almost like Pokemon, that's a stroke of genius. You want them all, because if you've played a Three Kingdoms game of any kind before, you will be familiar with most of them, or at least you'll notice the names. And that is one thing, if you've never played a Three Kingdoms game before, you will be massively confused about everything. This is not the best introduction to the Three Kingdoms mythos, I have to say that. But if you've watched this far already, one would assume you are mildly familiar with it, so go buy it. PS2 prices for games are expensive these days, but Dynasty Tactics is still very reasonably cheap. Don't miss out. Herman. I'll teach you. So, imagine my utter amazement and excitement. One year after loving the living hell out of Dynasty Tactics, along comes its sequel. And, well, I liked it as a teenager, but I didn't love it as much as the original. I'll get to why soon. But going in as a fully formed adult, maybe playing it again almost 20 years later, I was curious about how I feel about it. Again, Koei were in a bit of a predicament with how to sell you the same game again. And it's true, it was a difficult one, because if you're looking at the battlefield, you're thinking, hang on a minute, this is pretty much the same thing. Well, no, they've updated the mechanics and added in some new things. The biggest gimmick added is to increase combos, and there's something called a chain attack. This is different to the link attack, which still does exist, but chain attack is also initiated by the strategist. They can add the ability to more than one officer at a time if they're in range, and this essentially allows that officer to use multiple tactics one after another. So you could use charge, then raid straight after each other. Technically, you could use up their entire stock of tactics equipped if they all lined up. But that is the issue. Due to the effects of 90% of the tactics, it's actually really difficult to make a chain with just one officer unless the enemy officer is wedged in somewhere and doesn't get flung away. So while it is a neat idea, I don't think it's always a thing I would use often. Maybe there is an exploit that I never cracked as a kid or didn't spend enough time with here now that my brain is fully formed and full of alcohol, I mean cleverness. And tactics are not as easy to come by, at least not if you'd expect them to come like they do in the original, because here you have to essentially buy them for your officer, which can get expensive. And building multiple armies with officers who can actually do something useful, well, you're going to need to grind for craft, which is this game's cash, essentially. Yeah, now they've added capitalism to the equation. It's a civil war. Give it to me now. I'll pay you at the end if we're not all dead. To me, it seems they wanted to make the game far less breakable because not only do they make it difficult to get actual tactics, but even if you have the right amount and set up enough to capture the enemy officer, they don't automatically join you. You have to persuade them at the end of the battle to join you and 95% of the time, they will not. You just let them go. Are you joking? Like, I should lop your head off, fool. And this is just disappointing. It makes setting up the best combos possible not as interesting to do. I mean, I 100% get why they made this decision, because it makes for a far better game balance. But for me, they just made it less fun. Granted, they probably didn't intend the original to be that way. It was more like serendipity, but it's kind of like you see a bunch of kids having tons of fun kicking a football on the playground. They're just going nuts. There's no rules. They're playing how they want and having a good laugh doing so. But then the teacher comes in, picks up the ball and tells them to play proper football, which while probably for the best due to the beauty of football and the rules, you've essentially deflated them. They were having fun doing their own thing. And this kind of feels like that. Dynasty Tactics 2 is technically a better game, but I don't like it as much because it makes me play by the rules. Those rules are good though. I'm trying not to be biased. I have to appreciate it's a more accomplished game. Way more solid mechanics and thought put into it. They've filled the holes with cement. 
For example, you can make it easier to recruit enemy officers, but it requires you sending spies into enemy territory and using money to make the selected officer distrust their leader. This is hit and miss. It doesn't always work, and especially with money so needed to improve your current officers, I didn't always find it was worth the expense. At least I didn't find the good balance back in the day, nor today. Not only that, but there's also an accuracy stat for tactics. But you can also talk with ally officers in the middle of battle, at least those who are mildly important and have strong relationships with one another. This can give you a small boost and also help you recover from confusion, which is a tactic the enemy loves to do in this game especially. In fact, the AI is much improved, and on the standard difficulty, it is a tougher game than the first. But just for note, unlike the original game, there are three difficulty options to choose from right at the start. I believe the first game has increasing difficulty as you beat one hero's campaign and move on to the next, but I can't remember if my brain just made that up or not. You can now look in towns and talk to people in the villages, interact with more things, do many more immersive things. This certainly makes up a little bit for my disappointment. However, now you can't even see all the map at once. You can't see the development of the land or other forces, which I really, I really don't understand why. I want to see how things are going for everyone else. It's a disappointment, which I have to say, that disappointment only manifested itself after I went back to play Dynasty Tactics 1 because when I originally played this, I think I did like Dynasty Tactics 2 more, but then a few years later I had some free time and you know what I fancied? I fancied some Dynasty Tactics, so I went back to 1, absolutely loved it, then played 2 straight away and I'm like, oh, I don't remember it being like this. So I know I sound down on it all, but really, Dynasty Tactics 2 is, it is also an excellent game, just in a different way. It's more strict, more serious, more refined. It's like playing chess with old people at the park. Whereas Dynasty Tactics 1 is like the kid's bouncy castle at a party, where someone spiked the squash with vodka. They both have their merits, and I do highly recommend both of them to be in your PS2 collection. They are honestly essential, and it is a travesty Koei never exploited it more. It's hardly as though they're known for their restraint. It is worth noting that after this, there was a PlayStation 4 game called God Seekers. It was almost a spiritual successor to Dynasty Tactics, following the life of Zhao Yun in a heavily fictionalized anime way, but to me, it looked so immensely boring that I never actually played it, and I didn't even fancy it for this video, so sorry for that. I don't want to sour my love for Dynasty Tactics by playing that game. Maybe one day in the future, but I'm just too busy and I don't want to do it. Oh wait! How can I forget the biggest addition to this game? Lu Bu! You can actually play as Lu Bu. Obviously massively fictionalized as he tries to make his own kingdom. As a kid, this was the one that I played first once I'd gotten out of the tutorial. Like, who wouldn't want to play as Lu Bu with his initially really strong officers like Zhang Ba, Zhang Liao, Gao Shun, Song Xian? He's got a solid crew to start off with. Sadly, they're all a bit dumb aside from Chen Gong, but it's fascinating to see how his story goes utterly insane. Obviously, with forks in the road as well. It also introduced the world to Lu Ling Qi, Lu Bu's daughter. Not sure how Diao Chan would feel about that, but it's ancient China. If you didn't have five daughters with three different women whose names you didn't even know, were you really a baller? She's pretty badass here and it's really quite cool. And seeing the grey colour of Lu Bu's army slowly take over the land is very satisfying. I really recommend choosing this scenario first, especially if you've just come off the back of Dynasty Tactics 1, because why would you want to play the normal Three Kingdoms straight away? Although if I am being frank, I think you should play Dynasty Tactics 2 first, because going backwards to the more free original afterwards is more acceptable, at least in my opinion. Anyways, to conclude, Dynasty Tactics 1, Dynasty Tactics 2, they're two of the greatest games ever made. I'm not even joking, like, I'm being serious. I think they're just amazing, and they're dirt cheap, kind of. Although now I've said that, watch eBay prices just whew. Get in while you can. When I first bought my PlayStation 2 with my hard-earned birthday and Christmas money combined, one of my earlier cheaper bargain bin secondhand purchases was a game called Kessen. Despite not being into Asian history at the time, the game certainly appealed to me. Samurai, they were cool. The gameplay was also something I don't really remember experiencing before, a real-time strategy war game. Memories of this are kind of vague, but one that stuck out to me far more was the sequel, a game so good 
I bought it twice. Once near launch before trading it in for newer games, and then again much later on second hand when I decided I missed it, and also the realization of something that bugged me for years. Remember a while back I talked about my purchase of that super fateful Dynasty Warriors 3. On the bus ride home looking at the manual, something kind of felt familiar. Well, I had played Kesson 2 well before Dynasty Warriors 3, but being kind of young and dumb, I had not put 2 and 2 together. Kesson 2, unlike the original, which was based on Japanese history, this was loosely based on the Three Kingdoms era, featuring Liu Bei, Guan Yu and the like, but perhaps they hadn't registered fully on my brain to realize I'd already played a game with these characters in. That's why, reading the manual to DW3, something was itching in my brain, like I kinda knew them but it wasn't clicking. And you can't blame me, Chinese names to an 11 year old doesn't exactly stick out, and Kesson 2 goes well off the rails in terms of the story presentation. The characters, aside from a few key heroes, are designed also very differently despite it being made by Koei. I mean Cao Cao is wearing red, isn't that illegal or something, where's his blue? I absolutely love this game and I think it's a bit of a gem, especially if you're into batshit insane takes on the characters and history. This is a real time strategy war game with two campaigns, starting off with the usual hero of Liu Bei, who is considered the easy mode, and then after that you can play as Cao Cao as he vows to conquer the world. I mean this dude, he wants to take on the Romans, but first it's China. The plot starts completely completely off from the beginning. Liu Bei and Diao Chan are a couple in this one, which will never not be hilarious. Thankfully, Koei somehow restrained themselves from adding Lu Bu in here, so uh, yeah, he can't get too angry. Yes, in the real story, it was Diao Chan's curves that uh, persuaded Lu Bu to betray and assassinate the tyrant Dong Zhuo, which inadvertently led to Cao Cao gaining control of the empire and stamping his authority on northern China. But Diao Chan is even more special in this story as she knows where the mandate of heaven is. The only person in China who knows where it is as the emperor gifted it to her. Hey, he must have been low on dollar bills at the strip joint. And because Cao Cao wants to be the emperor, he kidnaps her and he demands it. Liu Bei wants to save Diao Chan and rather bravely, like the melodramatic story this has, he tells his entire army they need to fight for him so he can get his girlfriend back. And everyone is like, well okay my horny little man, let's get his poon back. I can get behind the ridiculousness because it's genuinely hilarious and yet they're actually trying. It's like watching Samurai Cop. Forget the tens of thousands of lives that will be lost, forget being a man of the people and wanting to give them a better life if they fight for him, no, he needs to get his dancer girlfriend back. This was 100% written and developed by 19 year olds, it might even been written by the same people as Dude Where's My Car and Dallas combined. What a combo. It's obvious why this game and these characters took me so long to connect it with the actual Three Kingdoms universe. It makes characters up, it makes them do completely different things to what they did in the real story, like Su Shu being Zhuge Liang's sworn brother. There's even characters that have had sex changes. Xu Yo is now a badass babe, Su Ju, well she's got an air of like Queen Victoria about her in this one, and Yu Jin, I don't even know, but after 8 pints of lager, who's really asking? There is a large focus on magics and mystics and it even brings in Himiko who was the queen of Japan or at least one of the queens in Japan at the time and she is Cao Cao's lackey. One of the largest supporting characters is Mei Sanyang who is completely made up but I guess they needed some more femininity otherwise you can't have a mando drama sausage fest, the world does not work like that. There aren't a ton of characters in this game and I think that works in its favour because you get attached to all of them in battle. Even Tai Mao who by all accounts was a bit of a prick but the fact that he became a valuable addition to your small team makes me far more fond of him. If playing the likes of Romance of the Three Kingdoms or Dynasty Tactics, just the amount of names and faces is incredibly overwhelming. And if you're diving in from being unfamiliar, then they aren't going to mean jack to you, but Kesson 2 does a decent job even if only about 1% of it is true. And their designs, oh my god, like what is going on here? It's both amazing 
and tragic at the same time. You've got the overly simple Guan Ping and Zhou Tang, but then you've got generals with chandeliers and magic carpets on their head. And Sun Quan, he looks like he belongs in Kid Icarus or something. But enough about the presentation, how about the gameplay? Well, I am pleased to say, man, Kesun 2, it's a fantastic game. I can imagine there was a period in time when this type of game was laughed at, but I genuinely found it just as compelling to play today as I did as a almost teenager. Be warned, the tutorial will test your patience. I'm against tutorials at the best of times, especially ones that constantly interrupt the flow, and this is the interruptiest and stoppiest of the floweth of the lot of them. But I guess it's important because Kesson 2 does some fascinating things with its gameplay. It's a real-time strategy game with preset battles, very loosely based on the Three Kingdoms. It has the main elements like Chibi, where Zhuge Liang and Zhou Yu's fire stratagem burnt the giant Cao Cao armada to a crisp. You have a battlefield map where you can instruct your individual units where to go and who to attack. It's quite basic in this aspect, but what sets it apart in this area is the fact that one, you can maneuver the army by yourself, like directly control them, which is cool for about five minutes before you realize you don't want to waste your time and you have other priorities to begin on with in the battle. Uh, but number two, once one of your units is having a scrap with an enemy unit, you can zoom into the fight and take direct control of your general or the lieutenants, and you can attack the enemies yourself. Like you can't massively affect the outcome, but it can a little bit, and it definitely adds way more involvement into what is otherwise sometimes a waiting game. Not only can you roam around the battlefield attacking the enemy, you can also even initiate charges by holding the back button and unleashing it. The best thing though is the tactics. Each general has their own set of tactics they can unleash, whether a raid where your general goes on a Super Saiyan rampage or an organized charge or even a super powerful magic attack. It's just awesome to get involved and influence the course of the battle. Just randomly zooming in and out of skirmishes, one minute controlling Zhou Tang before switching to Liu Bei to initiate a rally to increase morale, then going to your big map to direct Zhuge Liang to intercept an incoming force. It always feels like there's something to do even when there isn't really something to do. In the first campaign, they can really feel overpowered, but eventually the enemy will start to make use of them and you'll be scrambling for tactics to take the advantage. It reminds me of an Xbox game, the OG Xbox that I, I really can't remember what it's called and Google just did not help, but it kind of copies this aspect of controlling the general and affecting the battle. And no surprise, that was awesome too. But please hit me up if you know which game I'm talking about on the Xbox. It's been driving me mad for the past two decades. I had such a good time playing this for the first time in almost 20 years. I, it can feel a bit basic for strategy fans, but I also have to say I loved the two strategies you are able to choose post and pre-battle. Each time after a major battle, before the next challenge comes up, usually around three of your generals will pop in to give you their advice on what should be done to improve your luck. This can range from stealing enemy supplies to increase yours, or going on a recruitment spree to get more men, or even letting one of your generals go on a tiger hunt which will increase their fame and their strength. It's not often there is a defined correct answer, as they all do something really good, but then you have options like recruiting an officer to your side, which that's a no-brainer really. Even just one extra general on the field, as wimpy as Tai Mao will be, he's still a great asset and can help double up on an opponent. Then pre-battles, you can choose usually one of three tactics, which again, may not be massively obvious as to which is the correct choice, but it offers a different experience if replaying. Just something as simple as deciding which valley to lay the trap in, or which route to retreat through. This can affect who is helping who, which generals will be affected by it. Minor but enjoyable choices and I really really appreciated it. Where I think the big issue can come from and criticism from strategy purists is that on the whole, at least from the handful of hours I played for this video and from my memory, it does kind of feel a bit linear in the fact that there is a defined way the battles should play out and you kind of know what that is and you can't really deviate from the plan without things going horrifically wrong. Things are set up to happen and you will be playing your part within it, which personally, I don't mind so much since it's all done quite cinematically. There are cutscenes and twists which make it feel like something epic. 
And for me, it's fine because you feel like you're contributing on a micro level, repositioning your units just slightly to give you a better advantage so they don't get outnumbered or bottlenecking your opponent, strategic retreats if things aren't going your way. The base positioning that the game gives you isn't always ideal, so you can adjust slightly. And of course, big use of tactics is essential in turning the tide of battle. And of course, the strategy pre-battle can make the experience really quite different from one another. It is a little bit easy, but there is an exponential difficulty increase if you complete both routes and unlock an expert mode, which I've heard is really, really difficult. I can't remember if I ever played that as a kid. Probably not, because I was really dumb. Overall, oh man, Kesson 2 might not be the best strategy game ever made, but it's the one that has the most heart. It's adorable, compelling, it's unique, it's surprisingly casual and accessible. It's got an insane story, crazy characters and gameplay mechanics that are not really seen elsewhere. It's been over 20 years since this came out and I'm surprised this isn't even considered a cult classic. Cults, what are you playing out? Stop brainwashing people, talk about Kesson 2. Man, Dynasty Tactics 1 and 2 Kesson 2, these are genuinely amazingly put together games and they're all dirt cheap. If you have a PS2 and a collection brewing, buy them. In my opinion, they are essential games and don't just buy them, play them as well, okay? These games deserve to be played. So, in terms of following the Three Kingdoms story, it's fair to say Koei has taken many a liberty to stick it in a video game. Dynasty Warriors tries, but has to go rogue, especially as time goes on, and the barrel is well and truly scraped. Dynasty Tactics is writing its own fan fiction, and the writer of Kesson 2 was basically given a list of names and decided to write it on the door of a bathroom stall, a place where there is the most shit. Much to my pleasure, I may add. However, there is one series that has tried to remain faithful to the source material, and that is The Romance of the Three Kingdoms. It's literally named after the novel. These are far more serious games. There's no over-the-top metal music, no dumb cutscenes with beautifully awful voice acting, no one goes Super Saiyan here. These are for the gentleman gamer. People who smoke pipes, wear a monocle, drink a glass of sherry as they conquer the whole of China. Romance of the Three Kingdoms is perhaps Koei's longest running franchise all the way back from 1985 to the modern day. It is on its 14th mainline entry, but between them all there's been countless amounts of ports, remakes, expanded editions, Genuinely, every console in existence has at least one of these games on the system. They may not have released in the West, but they are there. Even the Wii U got one, now that's commitment. The Dreamcast, the Wonderswan, the 32X, they are like rats. You're never too far away from the Three Kingdoms series. But, of course, in the West, even to this day, it is quite obscure. In fact, despite North America getting most of them, in low quantities, on the bigger consoles of the era like the NES, Super Nintendo, PS1, Europe didn't get any of them until Romance of the Three Kingdoms 8 on the PS2, which just so happens to be the one that I picked up. I think I saw it advertised in the back of a manual for another game of theirs, so I went into Electronic Boutique almost every weekend asking when they were getting it. Eventually, I got it, and essentially lost my teenagehood to this game, which is weird because it wasn't really my type of game. I like tactical games, but it does like a bit of pizzazz. I like a bit of extravagance and a bit of story, because these games like both of that. They can be quite dry at times, and I remember when I used to go to my dad's at the weekend, he used to watch me play games, like whatever the game I was playing, he'd just sit there on the sofa and he would watch me. But when I started playing this game all the time, every time, he got bored and eventually started going upstairs to watch his DVD box sets of Charmed and Stargate SG-1. I'm sure this game ruined our relationship. In fact, I'm pretty sure he even used osmosis to make sure we weren't even blood related anymore. Powerful stuff. They are not the most visually interesting games, nor are they interesting to talk about, but when you're playing them, they can be utterly compelling and addictive. So, 
I'm not going to spend too long on these despite my love for them and I'm mostly showing Romance of the Three Kingdoms 8 because that is the one that I loved and still love dearly. The older titles, I did go back and try to play some of them and while for the time they would have been amazing for what they were trying to do, they are kind of too archaic for me. I mean, the first game on the NES, I can't even figure out the goddamn menus. You're inputting codes like you're ordering a takeaway over the phone to some bloke who can barely speak English. I'll have the number 30, please. But instead of getting the finest tikka masala this side of Parsons Cross, you end up invading a neighboring province. We've all been there after a night out. I am ashamed to say I could just not work out how to do anything here. I played Wall of Fire on the Sega Saturn because, hey, if I do do Saturn games after I finish my Dreamcast adventure, I'd need to do that at some point. So why not do it half a decade early? Or oh, you make me a full-time creator, then I'll do them side by side. Patreon is that way. While they all follow the same premise of trying to conquer China, can we have switched things up between entries? Like from the beginning, you mostly could choose a select few warlords within a few defined eras of the history. For example, the Yellow Turban Rebellion, Dong Zhuo's dominance, when the Three Kingdoms are formed. But gradually, you could choose many more dates and situations. So you have a lot of variety, and it's essentially a pick your own challenge. You want the easy army or the crappy warlord with one city that no one likes? I love that aspect. If you want to play as Yan Baihu and get rejected at every turn because everybody thinks you're a scumbag, well, that's my choice. And he always dies after about five minutes, so what's the point anyway? You have to send armies to conquer cities. Sometimes this is automatic, sometimes there's actual battle mechanics. That was never really the interesting part for me. I enjoy letting the computer deal with the fights. In fact, playing the Saturn version as Yuan Shao, I'm trying to conquer Lu Bu. But oh man, these fights are so long. In fact, even in Three Kingdoms 8, my favorite game of the lot of them, the battles can be a little bit boring because it tries to be mildly realistic with month-long sieges. I just wasn't anticipating that it would actually take one goddamn month to play. The only time it's been really interesting for me was during 14. If you don't want to fight though, there is diplomacy by giving gifts, bribes, allegiances, so you can decide to try both ways of conquering, fighting or diplomacy. Most entries only allow you to play as the leader of a clan, dictating things to your vassals. But with 8 and a couple of others, you can actually play as a general or just a politician. You can work your way up to being the greatest general in the land or the most revered advisor to a king. You can improve your stats and relationships with other people. You can even go rogue and rebel. But that almost never works unless you're a charismatic chad and you're working for a no qualms about it tyrant. You can resign and then bugger off to start your own little empire. That's what I love about 8. There's almost endless replayability because you can play as anyone and do anything. You can set your own goals and challenges. You can just be a badass general if you want. If your kingdom falls, well then you can just get hired by the conqueror. What's wrong with being a general for hire? It doesn't need to be the end if your boss gets his head chopped off. Although to be fair, be careful because maybe your head will unexpectedly get chopped off too. But that's fine because if you die, you can take control as your son. If you have a son, that is. Back in the day, I used to make heavy use of the character editor. You can make up new characters and add them as children to existing generals. You can make them a god or a loser or even just a normal guy just trying to get by. I'd make loads of children to random generals or like make Yuan Shao have a new eldest child who was so badass that when Yuan Shao dies, he gets taken over by a god more or less and then Cao Cao has something to think about. This idea of a playable normal dude isn't always present, like in the most recent game 14, which I also adore, that's exclusive to being leaders only, which I get. It's a totally different gameplay style. Same goal to conquer China, but they play very, very differently. And even though I would love the option to play as Liao Hua, there's no doubt I love this game as well. In fact, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 8 is my most played PS2 game, while Romance of the Three Kingdoms 14 is my most played Nintendo Switch game. This diplomacy and strategy bundle on the Switch, one of my best purchases. The physical release is quite rare now. I mean, the one in Japan and Hong Kong are everywhere, but they don't have English. Only this one with English released in Singapore. And my god, did I get my money's worth. And it's kind of lucky in some regards that whatever console I was mainly playing between the PS2 and the Switch didn't really have an English Three Kingdoms game on it. 
otherwise my productivity in life would have plummeted. Perhaps some things aren't as in-depth as I wish, but then again, maybe that's why I can pick it up and play any time. I don't need to think about it too much. It can be super easy if you happen to find a warlord with over 100 intelligence, because it means they will almost always be correct about what they think the outcome will be. Will you be able to hire this person? Will this person surrender? They will know and there will be no risk. But you know, as I've said, you can really make your own challenge with these games. And I am delighted to hear that it was recently announced, seemingly completely at random, that Romance of the Three Kingdoms 8 is getting remade and re-released next year. Like, where the hell did that come from? Why that one? I mean, I've never been so happy, but I am massively confused. I didn't know it was a popular entry. Of all the games, they chose that one. From the brief footage that we saw, I mean, it looks kind of completely different, but I'm really excited and I cannot wait. As I've said, these games can be a bit dry, but for me, this is the kind of game where you can create your own stories and as the games got bigger and bigger on your hardware, the more customizable they've become, allowing you to do almost anything with them. You can be who you want, when you want, do what you want. So watching gameplay footage, you think it's boring, but it's so easy to get invested in your character. I mean, seriously, if you invest 30 hours conquering China, you're going to be mildly loving the person you are and the badass generals alongside you. Seeing which generals stick out this time, who are the heroes of this playthrough? That's why I like the deed system in 8. That really shows what the people did, not only on the battlefield, but domestically too. Like you can be a domestic god and improve your standing in society, even if you can barely pick up a stick, never mind duel Zhang He. Heroes come in different guises. So while you may be tempted to pick someone like Lu Bu, the clever buggers can also provide something useful. In fact, with Three Kingdoms 8, there is no way I could conquer China without the strategists making ploys. So yeah, I will leave it here because I think I could go on and on and on, but you might be falling asleep already. Are you still awake? Well, if you are, you must be really enjoying this video. Top props to you. And if you want to support me because you like it so much, I do have a Patreon and that is the best way you can support me. You get many benefits in exchange. You get all the videos early, ad free. You get exclusive bonus content for each video I make. Like for this video, I look at something quite obscure, another PS2 game from Koei called Mystic Heroes, a game I always saw on the store shelves as a kid, but I never took the plunge to buy it. Well, now you can see what I think of it on Patreon right now with the link below. You also get access to behind the scenes video updates, polls and access to a secret discord go check it out with the link below i think it's good value for money for the things you get you can support both me and my dear wife who edits all the audio for a bit more jordan on this channel so yeah she has to put up with full unedited jordan in all his nasal glory it's a thankless job we are not done with koei yet They've got one more game up their sleeve. Of all the Three Kingdoms games in this episode, Wolong The Fallen Dynasty is the latest big budget game. It's one that's entered into the public sphere, probably with most of them not realizing it's a Three Kingdoms game. In fact, that was me. I knew this game was coming out, I'd seen the article headlines and the like, but I never actually realized it was a Three Kingdoms game until someone asked me my thoughts on it because they knew I was a fan of the era. Like, surely that's something you want to talk about. And it's published by Koei. Maybe they didn't want people to dismiss it as like a another Dynasty Warriors game, give it too much of a stigma, because it's certainly not going for that vibe. This is a balls-hard 3D action game, and it's from Team Ninja, who are trying their own spin on Souls-like gameplay. And maybe it's because I don't play modern games too much these days, like too many systems and inputs just for the sake of it. But God almighty, this game is fucking hard. I mean, I used to think I used to be a decent gamer. No, I'm just a big bag of pathetic bollocks after playing this. Team Ninja ain't messing around. They've done Neo and Ninja Gaiden. Now it's Three Kingdoms turn and it's grizzly. Not one to stay within the realms of reality, this is full of the supernatural and folklore elements, which is personally why I never clicked on it was connected to the Three Kingdoms. I just saw a big giant demon and thought, cool, but then it slipped out of my consciousness. 
The game starts, but where? The Yellow Turban Rebellion. You are just a normal soldier dude, part of a local militia. The hero from nothing who rescues a young boy who has some sort of magical amulet. At which point, you become mostly immortal, which gives a good excuse for the Souls-like difficulty. You can actually create your own character, and I was initially trying to create my wife. You know, make her into the badass lady that she is. Then I remembered... This is a Koei game. So, uh, yeah, sorry, love, and sorry, everyone at home. Really, I don't get to play triple D, I mean, triple A games often these days, so let me have my little bit of fun, okay? This game is actually phenomenally well done for what it's going for. The themes are excellent as the demonic twist of the whole thing really adds a new layer to the narrative. Because yeah, as well as fighting humans, you also fight former humans, also known as zombies as well as beastly entities for the bosses. The environments, oh, they're just so amazing. Despite the zombie aspect, they are probably the most realistic depiction of events there's ever been. Just the death, destruction, disease, unimaginable cruelty that represents the horrific brutality of the era that we just can't possibly imagine. When regard for other human life was still an afterthought to your own gains. It's terrifying that we do have this in our nature, but we've somehow managed to suppress it, for the most part, to enhance civilization. I mean, we have sandwich toasters for God's sake. If we didn't suppress that rage and that hatred and all that stuff, we would not have sandwich toasters, much to the benefit of mankind and especially students around the world. If this kind of incivility was still going on, we definitely would not have waffle makers. Oh, well, maybe as a torture device, because Waffled balls, that really sends a message to your enemy. Did I say I love the way this game looks? It's amazing, please give me more of this. The gameplay, well, it's Dark Souls with Team Ninja stamped on it. It's a brutally unforgiving game in the wrong hands, i.e. my hands. A couple of slashes from a random nobody and you are down. And boy, does this game love to spring random people hiding. Yeah, thanks mate, waiting there long, were ya? It has a light attack heavy attack thing that you'll be used to with Dynasty Warriors, but this is a game that's all about being careful. If anything, it's more about dodging and parrying than going full-blown T-Rex on their arses. You have to be more aware about pressing the dodge button since powering through enemies about to swing barely flies. You're gonna take a whack and then you'll be dead. It has this weird blend of slow and methodical battles with coked up ninja fighting. And yeah, you're gonna die quite a lot. I've never, ever been good at defensive play. It's just not how I like to play games. Your dodge inputs have to be perfect. And let's just say I have all the timing of a paternity test at a christening. Never welcome, no matter the result. Maybe I'm just getting old, or maybe I've been playing too many retro games, or dare I say it, too many Nintendo games. But goddamn, how many buttons does one need to use? There's just so many things going on here, I feel like I've been defrosted from an Ice Age glacier. Holding down one each of the shoulder buttons brings up different shortcuts for different things. Special attacks, changing weapons, telling your partner to go out and attack, magic attacks, scratching your balls and sniffing your fingers. It's massively bewildering. And as I say, that may very well be because I'm ancient, but surely not all of this is needed. You don't need this much stuff going on. And I think this may be a good example of why modern games rarely do too much for me these days. It's like they're forced to add stuff for the sake of marketing or consumer groups or pressure from other games out there. There's too much stuff going on and they need to force it on you with tutorials that no one wants to read. Which, I know, I am complaining, but actually, I really do like this game. I probably wouldn't like it as much if it was set somewhere else with other people, but seeing my favourite historical figures in full AAA tilt with a new twist on the narrative and incredible if baffling action, I just really enjoy it. I just wish it was a little bit simpler. I'm sure you can ignore most stuff like upgrading equipment or the borderline incomprehensible levelling up or the... Oh god, here we go again. It's a pretty linear game, the levels aren't too huge, but you often have a small playground to go different ways through them. Like this village, which is quite tough, but once you die a few times and you know where the enemies are, you can easily sneak up on them and stealthily get through it. In fact, you know what we need? Tenchu. Bring that back, guys. Although, to be fair, I think my greatest criticism outside the amount of systems is that the enemies are almost 
blind, like completely blind, not almost blind, they are completely blind. Like I know nutrition wasn't the best during this era. They didn't have McDonald's to, you know, fill their void with a McFillet, but I'm pretty sure their eyes weren't this bad. I mean, you can be standing right in front of them and they can't see you. It's really dumb. I know it's to help balance the game out by having them being negligent and conveniently facing out over a mountain ledge, but it looks ridiculous. It breaks the immersion. Now, I have not completed the game for this video. I'm guessing I'm only about like a quarter of the way through, but I love the idea of teaming up with heroes like Zhao Yun, Zhang Fei to battle soldiers, the undead alongside divine beasts. As long as you don't mind failing your way to success, I think you will enjoy this too. I like that your character actually appears properly in cutscenes. Maybe it's a common thing nowadays, but back in my day, if you had some fancy armor or a different costume, when it went to the cutscenes, you'd be back to the default one. But this is some genuinely impressive stuff with your created character looking exactly like they do in the seamless cutscenes with their outfits and stuff, and yeah, it's great. And despite being a silent protagonist for reasons of not needing to pay a voice actor, the other voice actors are exceptional. It's all in Chinese, as it should be, and there's some really good performances here. I'm really impressed Koei held off on cheesy English voiceover. They stayed really respectful because this isn't a campy game at all. It's really serious despite the odd mustache twirling villain. If I had the time, I would definitely persevere with this game and battle my way through to the end to see where it actually ends. I'm guessing it's not at the end of the Three Kingdoms. In fact, I would be surprised if it even got to the Three Kingdoms part of the Three Kingdoms story. I still haven't finished off the Yellow Turbans yet. It's not easy work when half of them are the undead. All in all, a great effort from Koei. Why don't the Dynasty Warriors games look like this? That would be amazeballs. Fantastic stuff. Just chill out on all the systems, simplify it a little bit if a sequel ever comes along. Now, we are going to focus less on Koei's big franchises and series and talk about games from other developers, because despite Koei doing their utmost to promote this history, they don't actually own it. As I said in the intro, Three Kingdoms is still huge in Asia, and video game companies rightly feel there is material to be mined. And one of the earliest stalwarts alongside Koei were the equally awesome Capcom. Aside from the early HD era, when Capcom were renamed Crapcom for about five years, they're now just as awesome as they'd ever been, and it's nice to see they threw their hat into the ring in terms of Three Kingdoms video games. Destiny of an Emperor. Oh boy, the first time I ever booted up an NES emulator, my first game was not Zelda, or Metroid, or the original Final Fantasy. No, it was Destiny of an Emperor. I don't know exactly what motivated me to play NES games on my first laptop, but it was probably this. A JRPG starring the Three Kingdoms heroes. Hell to the yes, baby! Of course I played this first. Why aren't there more standard JRPGs in the Three Kingdoms era? It's perfect material for this kind of gameplay style. So many characters, a long winding story with drama. It needs to be done. More. I wasn't exactly an NES kid. I knew one person who had an NES in my youth, a neighbor, and the only time I saw it was when I went into a bedroom for the first and only time. And I tell you, I wasn't thinking too much about what an NES was. I was completely terrified about being in a cute girl's room. Yeah, I'd blocked this out of my memory until very recently. And uh, I think she showed me her Super Mario Bros. Yeah, I was too young for an NES and there was no hand-me-down console for me like the Super Nintendo was. That's what I remember. So it was more curiosity than nostalgia. And you know what? When it's like the mid-2000s and you find out about emulators and you stick this on and oh, it's an interesting experience. So it starts out in the Peach Garden, just like where most stories like to start as Liu Bei, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei swear an oath of brotherhood. Liu Bei's mom tells them, get off your ass and bring back glory to the Han Empire, which is being ravaged by the Yellow Turbans. You'll notice the high quality character artwork, and that's because Capcom used a source material other than Romance of the Three Kingdoms. It's based on a manga called Tenchi wo Kurao. In fact, that's the actual name of the game in Japan. That was probably quite popular amongst teenagers at the time, and gameplay-wise, you can see much familiarity with Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. 
It has that charmingly archaic interface where if you press A, which is usually done to interact with something in modern games or even games a few years later from this era. But yeah, if you press A, it actually brings up a menu and you have to select interact or select talk. It's stuck in like PC adventure game style. That always annoyed me when I first played Final Fantasy 2. Like, why is it making me go an extra step? If I wanted a menu, I would press start, right? What do you mean start was used to literally start the game? Are you an etymologist or something? Get out of here. Yes, it's easy to laugh at old games, just like it's easy to laugh at old people. But sometimes they deserve it, let's be frank. Some games and some people are pricks. Just because they're 80 doesn't change their personality to a nice old nana. Pricks are pricks. What am I talking about? Oh, the game. It's a super interesting game, if not exactly nicely balanced for a modern game. In fact, I heard the last modern gamer who tried playing this had to jump into their safe room for an hour, have a little cry, and vlogged on Twitter to make themselves feel better. What can I say? I had to get something off my chest. As you're walking around, it looks like your classic games of the era, but what sets this apart is two things, at least I think. Firstly, you can recruit dozens and dozens of generals. There are lots of Three Kingdoms people just hanging around that can join your party if you talk with them. But even enemy generals can join you if you defeat them in battle. Sometimes you can persuade them to join your team. You can bribe them with a nice horse. Ah, oh, thanks. Where am I going to stick that in my three-room apartment? Couldn't you have given me like a hamster or something? That's manageable and adorable. So yeah, you can almost treat this game like a game of Pokemon, where you can go out and recruit them all, just like Dynasty Tactics. And there's seriously a lot of them. Again, mostly you're not gonna be using them all because you'll probably just stick with your core team, but it's nice to have since if one of your generals faint in battle, it's quite expensive to revive them. You've got to buy a really, really overpriced potion to bring them back. Sleeping at the inn or praying at the church won't make their axe wound disappear. The battles are random when walking in the overworld and oh my god, it's insane how common they are and how long they go on for. Even when you press the all out button, they go on forever. It didn't help that the first battle I played in this, I forgot one super important thing, equipment. For some reason, even though you start the game with weapons and armor, the game isn't kind enough to equip them for you. You have to go into the menu and painfully equip them one by one. And I know, I'm complaining, it's archaic as hell, but for the time, I'd have loved this if I'd had it alongside the other classics. In fact, I completed this on an emulator like 15 years ago, and I loved it then. It has magic attacks, it has unique mechanics such as supplies for your army, you have a designated strategist. It's not going to give you the full lowdown on the story of the Three Kingdoms, it's more of a go here, kill this person sort of game with dialogue lasting barely a few sentences. But I think Destiny of an Emperor for the time is an excellent game, and it's a shame they never took the series further. We didn't get a sequel. Well, we didn't get a sequel, but Japan did, the lucky gits. Destiny of an Emperor 2 was released on the Famicom. Maybe Capcom in the West weren't too happy with the sales of the first, so passed up on the second. It released in 1991 as well, so maybe the Super Nintendo also influenced that decision, which is a shame since it improved on a few aspects, such as there being no rations, meaning you could explore freely without needing to worry about going too far without food for your troops. I'm not going to go into this one because it's quite similar, but it is worth noting that despite being released only in Japanese, there is a fan translation for everyone to sample, so go check that out if you enjoyed the original game. And for NES games, hell yes. As I said, I'm not an NES gamer by my designation in life of being British, but if I did ever get an NES and start buying NES games and start my midlife crisis early, then Destiny of an Emperor would definitely be the first game that I purchased. In fact, I'm 33 now, so I might actually start looking on eBay. Capcom wasn't done with the Three Kingdoms era, however, because the manga that Destiny of an Emperor was based on was prime time goodness for a beat-em-up. Dynasty Wars. Strangely, in Japan, this game is called exactly the same as the NES RPG. They are both called Tenchi wo Kurao. Exactly that. No subtitles, no difference, no specification. They even released in the same year, 1989. What's that all about? True, they are based off of a specific manga, which the name is taken from, but damn, add some difference for some dude in 2023 trying to talk about them. Thankfully, Capcom in the West knew they had to do something about it, and they localized this as Dynasty Wars rather than Destiny of an Emperor. So yeah, this is from 1989, and for me, 
This looks pretty awesome for the era, although I'm not sure I'm even legally allowed to judge the visuals, because I wasn't actually around at this time. In 1989, I was, at best, at the most generous, a sperm swimming in my dad's balls. Although, to be fair, that's the same level of sentience as most digital found reviewers, so maybe I can judge the visuals. They're alright to me. This beat em up stars four characters. We've got Liu Bei, we've got Guan Yu, Zhang Fei, and Zhao Yun. Although they strangely anglicize their names, it's not Pinyin, I don't think it's Brute Taylor, it's more like Capcom team in America having no idea who these people are, so let's just write kind of what it sounds like. And fair dues, I would have done the same. Let's have Xiao Yun, the small cloud, which is what that says to me, my knowledge of Chinese. And of course, Zhao Yun really is the poster boy for this era. Brave, badass, unassuming, never does anything too dumb. Naturally, as an arcade beat em up, it's fairly tough. You're getting your ass nicely kicked, you're mounted, and it has an interesting set of controls. Firstly, you only have three lanes to walk on, which usually I'm not a fan of, but I think it does make sense. Makes it easier to line up your attacks. The most difficult thing to get my tiny head around was the direction facing. With two buttons, you can attack in front of you and behind you. But to actually turn around, you need to hold the direction and then the attack button, which is weird, but you know, horses aren't exactly known for their turning circle, so I get it. They're not skateboards, you can't just simply turn and face the other way. Oh, that would be pretty awesome if you could do that. I bet Kublai Khan could do that, that's why he took over China. One big mechanic is magic. You can pick up a handful of different magic attacks which sort of acts like a panic bomb that you'd find in a shooter. These will either clear the screen or big chunks of it. Very useful for spamming against bosses, which I most certainly took advantage of. And yes, my dear viewers, in terms of credits, I was feeding more than a skinny dude with a fetish. And what I actually liked about this game is that you can use credits before you die. You can use them to boost up your life and boost it way beyond the base level, which I took much advantage of. In real life, this would have cost a fortune, but I personally see it as revenge. Revenge on all those totally rigged arcade games as a kid that stole my hard-earned birthday money. The story is borderline nonsensical. I would not advise this to be your first stop on sucking in the Three Kingdoms lore. I know the story, and even I couldn't follow this. It doesn't help that the cutscenes last about 3 milliseconds because they needed more quarters rather than everyone gathering around for story time. Essentially, it follows the super early parts of the Three Kingdoms era, the Yellow Turban Rebellion, before then focusing your attention on Dong Zhuo, who is the final boss. And he's riding two horses. I don't know whether to laugh or applaud, he's so fat he needs two horses. But on the other hand, that is some damn impressive stretching. I bet he walks like he's got some unknown substance sliding down his legs. It's balls hard and the last boss just ridiculous. Like he just goes on and on and on in almost comical fashion. He's protected by Lu Bu because of course he is. And you can feel the living standards of those who live around the arcades drop like a stone because of how much they'll be spending on this rather than paying the gas bills. You'll be spending a fortune here. It is quite fun though, having to deal with a variety of troops along the way, using old school brutal war techniques that the UN wouldn't quite approve of these days, burning oil pots. Nah, the UN prefers supersonic missiles to obliterate your foes. I suppose it's mildly better than being melted. The game is even ballsy enough to give sequel bait during the end credits. Like, wow, you are confident, aren't you? I don't know if I fully love this game. As I've said, I'm not a huge fan of beat-em-ups in general, I find them quite repetitive and annoyingly unfair, and this ticks all those boxes. It does feel a bit generic, but it's 1989, and what else is out at this point? The arcade version Double Dragon, Final Fight, yeah, this is essentially par for the course, and it would have stood out immensely well alongside those like, 80s street brawlers. Ain't no drug riddle punks in this one, although Dong Zhuo probably snorted coke off Diao Chan's arse crack. Who wouldn't in his position? Although with his way, it's more like Coca-Cola. 
It is commendable for the time, although I don't know if I would choose to play this game ever again unless I had a friend playing with me, but I still need to capture one of those. So naturally, in the heat of 1989, as the kids in the arcade spent about $300 getting past Dong Zhuo, and they were pimping themselves out in the side alley just to get some dosh back, they were no doubt hotly anticipating the next release, which was obviously soon, right? I mean, it says soon at the end screen. Well, three years later, the sequel arrived, not called Dynasty Wars 2, no, called Warriors of Fate. Slightly confusing, but not unheard of for a sequel, but it's fine because the kids will be able to recognize the names, Xiao Yun and the such, right? No, because in the localization efforts of Capcom, they decided to throw out all of the Three Kingdoms business, it's gone. Sure, it looks like Huang Zhong, but no, in fact, for some unknown reason, they decided to make this more of a Mongol feeling with a completely impenetrable story. Not that people play for the story, and if you know the lore as it is, you can kind of put two and two together. Well, except when you're about to murder Cao Cao and his Chun-Li babes and Lu Bu come to the rescue. Not sure where that's come from, but it sounds like one hell of a dream. But yes, this is an even longer game than the original, clocking in at what, one hour. That's long for a brutal beat-em-up. This time, instead of four characters, there are now five. Liu Bei, known as Quan Ti in this Western version, has been ejected. And now we have Zhang Fei, Guan Yu, Zhao Yun, Huang Zhong, and yes, you guessed it, Wei Yan. Wait, what? Wei Yan? Wei Yan? I this is like the most baffling decision so far. It's a bait and switch. You're getting the full roster of the five Tiger Generals, Liu Bei's five most trusted, battle-hardened generals who never let him down. But then Cap comes like, <laughs> I got ya, no, 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 Ma Chao, are you having a laugh? Why would we give you Ma Chao? <laughs> But who cares? This is not Three Kingdoms, this is the Mongol Empire or something. What did Ma Chao do to deserve this rejection? It's like he's been kicked out of a boy band or something. His dad was just murdered, you can't take this away from him too. The gameplay is similar, but this time you're mostly on foot, and when you are on foot you don't need to press a button to turn around, thankfully. You can move all around the screen, any direction you push towards. It's a basic two-button game. There is a standard attack and a jump button, which for 1992, I think is surprisingly basic. But you can do special attacks by different directional inputs. In fact, I swear there's a bit of Street Fighter in here. Gone is the ability to use credits to spam up your health, which is quite unfortunate. But on the other hand, especially early on, the game isn't as brutal in terms of you getting hit. It plays a lot more like Streets of Rage 2. Enemies are a lot more considerate and willing to wait before striking. There's nothing wrong with springing an ambush and then staring at them for 5 seconds. It's a standard military tactic. If you press both buttons at the same time, each character will do sort of a windmill attack, as though they're an 8 year old thinking they're a helicopter. It's super useful to deal with getting surrounded. At first, I thought this game was quite easy if I kept doing this. Nothing can touch me, so I just kept spamming it. What I didn't realize is that it depletes your health if you do it. Once I saw that, it all kind of made sense. I just thought the enemies hit like a polax, which is why I constantly had so little health. But no, it's because I was sucking my own health down. Once I realized that, around the Battle of Changban, I saved it only for special occasions. And I know this is a popular mechanic in beat em ups for some bizarre reason. Literally everyone hates this, and yet developers, even to this day, think of it as some sort of tradition. I get it's to balance the game, but it's not nice or fun. This is actually a good game. It's better than Dynasty Wars, but on the other hand, it's more generic. Dynasty Wars had unique things to it, at least as far as I'm aware. I haven't played every arcade beat em up ever, and boy am I glad, but Warriors of Fate feels more like a palette swap of other famous beat em ups of the era rather than being its own thing. The only thing that is unique to it is the setting. Is it weird that this feels both fairer and yet more dickish than ever? Like, it only really spams enemies at you near the end, and it feels like a game that can be mastered if you're in the mood. But then it just randomly throws rocks at you from literally nowhere. Like, come on, dude, why are you suddenly playing dirty? The biggest major thing this has over the original is that you can cut people in half with your fists. My man Guan Yu needs to trim those nails after the war, obviously, because they're coming in pretty handy right now. 
And yeah, I don't have much else to say about this one aside from, despite the story being intelligible and going at the speed of sound, it has the greatest introductory line of any game ever. My load. My load. My load. I can't even think of a joke about that because it would not surpass my... My load! With Capcom out of the way, it's time to head into more beat-em-up goodness under a different developer. This time from a Taiwanese team, IGS. Better than IBS. Also known as International Game System. Originally focused on making arcade games back in the day, these days they spend their time developing cheap, mobile style looking games for both mobile and arcade. But their glory days, and probably what they're most known for, is the Knights of Valor series. This is a series that still echoes around today, despite being from 1999. While I don't think most Westerners have heard of this one, boy, you can go into any arcade or even just like a hairdresser's, a car dealership, loads of places that have knockoff main cabinets. This will be playing in attraction mode. It's another beat em up similar to Dynasty Wars, but this is far, far more popular. And to be frank, I can see why. There are five main titles, but plenty of enhanced or tweaked versions as well. Rather randomly, a few of them were released on the Nintendo Switch in a slightly simple retro collection, and that's what I'm playing for this video. If you check out the IGS Classic Arcade Collection, you will find Knights of Valor Superheroes Plus and Knights of Valor 2 Nine Dragons. It's kind of complicated as to where they all fit in, and I don't think they really care either. It's just like, here are some games in the franchise we own and enjoy. The first two are essentially the same game, probably tweaked a little bit, but if you like beat em ups, you'll probably enjoy this. As I've stated, they are very rarely been my sort of game. I said that quite a lot in this video, but I'm always willing to give them a shot. And it's much easier in 2023 when you don't have to pay money into the big machines every time the game decides you've had enough fun. I'm on a holiday for two days. My dad gave me a tenner. I'm not wasting it all trying to get through one game. I've got to sample all of them especially Jambo Safari, which is the greatest arcade game ever made, and it's a travesty it never came to the Dreamcast. Sega, I'm still waiting. Anyways, the best thing about these games, especially compared to Dynasty Wars, is the character selection. There are so many more, even in the lowest game. The superheroes version has nine playable characters. It's a shame we didn't get the base version of Knights of Valor 2, which had like dozens, probably copies of each other, but sometimes the name change is nice. The latest game in the series had literally dozens and dozens and dozens, but I think that was like a free game with weird monetization. But let's focus on what we've got here. For the first game, you start playing as Shu in a war against Wu, when Liu Bei's son is kidnapped by Sun Quan. I don't really remember that in the story, maybe it happens, but either way, you have to kick this lady's ass as a toddler stumbles across the battlefield, which instantly makes this show the game's personality compared to Dynasty Wars. For these games, you even get an inventory system. There are lots of sub-weapons littering the battlefield, and you can pick them up holding down one of the buttons, which allows a rudimentary selection wheel to pop up, and then you can pop them off with a different button. It's very awkward, shall we say. It's awkward picking them up, it's awkward selecting them, and it's even a bit awkward just using them. Sometimes it doesn't even register. It's a Teenage Jordan version of item usage. Awkward in every capacity. Each character has a wide array of moves as well, and it's once again just like a fighting game in terms of combo inputs. They all have their super special moves as well. Even better is that there are loads of multiple routes per mission. Right from the second screen, you're offered to go in multiple directions, which gives a different experience for multiple playthroughs. Obviously, I haven't sampled every route of every level in my short time with these games, but damn, it's really impressive especially with the second level of Mount Dingjun as you take on Xiaohou Yuan. Man, what a tease! Do I go left? Do I go right? Which one do I choose? I don't know! And I genuinely think these games are better than Capcom's. I know it's not a competition. These Taiwanese games were made a decade later, so obviously technological and design sensibilities had risen immensely, but I just enjoyed playing these a lot more. And I think the main reason is down to personality. This has way more personality than Capcom's games. When you fight a general in Dynasty Wars, it's like, well, they could be anyone. In fact, they're all rather generic, all things considered, but these games are just as extravagant as Koei at times. They have signature looks and stand out way more. Also, just random stuff happens. Like in Changban, I think it's Changban when Liu Bei's son is displaced. When you're escaping with the baby, 
Meng Huo romps in like, surprise, motherfuckers. Like, where did this guy come from? He popped in from northern Vietnam to kick ass, take names, and probably take some babies as well. What's in this box? A panther? Bloody hell, who left the panther in the box? I bet it was Dave. I bet it was Dave again. Fucking health and safety. They're going to be taking a shit on me for this. Snoozing bears on a bridge? Why not, good sir? It's kind of dumb fun. I think that's what most beat-em-ups should aspire to be. The greatest mistake a beat-em-up developer can make is making them serious. They need to be dumb and ridiculous. Just pull out a rocket launcher on a whip-wielding pole dancer. That is a beat-em-up, ladies and gentlemen. And these are... Of the ones I've played, I really quite like them a lot, even if I don't like the genre by default, so that's good. It's an improvement for me. I would say these are above average in terms of enjoyability. Not that I could tell you a game in the genre that I think is truly amazing, but that's besides the point. Moving on. <laughs> Twin Blaze of the Three Kingdoms is a modern game, even though it may not look like it. It's got that very distinct RPG maker vibe going on, which is often thrown around like an insult. But you know, there are plenty of RPG maker games that are worth playing. Of the thousands available, there are at least five worth playing. And I tell you what, I think this might be one of them. Actually, I don't even know if it was made in RPG Maker. Interestingly, as of the making of this video, this is only available on the Nintendo Switch for consoles and very super recently finally released on the PC. In fact, when I started making this video project, it wasn't even on PC, so it was a Switch exclusive for a good few years. As you can see, it's an RPG set in the Three Kingdoms era, and it instantly gave me strong vibes of Destiny of an Emperor. Like seriously, if you were hoping for a modern successor to Destiny of an Emperor, this is it ladies and gentlemen. It's not a one-to-one, -one, but it's the closest you'll come to it, and I do advise you don't judge a book by its cover. Really, think of this more like a Super Nintendo sequel to Destiny of an Emperor, and it all sort of makes sense. Everything's fine, and then it's also the best thing since sliced bread. Okay, maybe that's going too far. More like sliced tofu. It's definitely more edible. It vaguely follows the plot of the Three Kingdoms, and by vaguely, I mean the main protagonist is Su Shu, who I can't really say very well in Chinese because it's very difficult. Su Shu, Su Shu. Thanks guys. And if you don't know him, for about 5 minutes, he was a trusted advisor to Liu Bei before having to change allegiances because his mum told him his dinner was ready and he needed to come home. Can't play out all night with that Liu Bei fella, he's a troublemaker that one. Is this kinda weird? I'll fully admit I did not have the time to complete it for this retrospective. I played for quite a good few hours, but I still don't see the point of why Su Shu, why him? If they had a good excuse or reason, fine. You know, maybe the plot could detail his experience serving Liu Bei, but then having to go rescue his mom or something. But no, he's just a mute protagonist. He doesn't say anything. Well, other characters react to him as though he's saying something, but it's weird. Why him? They might as well have just made up a new person at this point. You immediately team up with Zhang Fei without Liu Bei or Guan Yu, you take on the yellow turbans with him. Again, why? Why not just have Liu Bei? It makes no sense. But perhaps that's the point. Maybe there is a aha moment later in the game involving the sky palace heavenly place. But so far, I'm a little perplexed. But I tell you, I tell you what, I enjoyed it way more than I thought. Again, it's more like fan fiction. Mi Ju, a trusted advisor to Liu Bei, is there with his traitorous brother, who again, yeah, he's a traitor just in a different way this time. It's kind of like a little twist. It's familiar, but not too familiar. And best of all, my main man, Liao Hua, is one of the earliest recruits that you can get. This game is instantly a 10 out of 10. And if you're wondering why I keep randomly mentioning this dude called Liao Hua, it's because there's some sort of impossibility about them. Something that's actually possible, but also impossible at the same time. He's strange because he's mentioned that he was originally a Yellow Turban supporter, which, as you may have realized, is right at the beginning of this story slash history. Well, he later joined Shu and also died in the same year that Shu was successfully invaded and destroyed, which, as you might guess, is near the end of the book slash story. So, theoretically, this dude was like 
a 90-year-old general charging into battle. It's like it's almost impossible, but also possible. And I like the idea that this dude, kind of a failed yellow turban, turned bandit, turned Guan Yu's toilet attendant, managed to become the highest ranked general in the Shu Empire through sheer determination of not aging to death. What a legend! Of course, it's more likely he was probably around 70 years old, but if you play Romance of the Three Kingdoms 8, you can see Koei were reluctant to call bullshit on it by having him at 94 years old during the last playable scenario. I love it. Anyways, he's my dude, he's like me, he's like a totally talentless guy who's just really solid and dependable. He ain't got talent, he's got gumption. You can always rely on him like a company. Any company or empire needs a dude like him by your side, yeah? He may not be winning the headlines, but he's always there. He always turns up for work, he doesn't die of old age, and he's a pretty cool fella. Anyways, back to our designated programming. The battle system is really quite unique. In fact, it's a strategy game layout, but with almost zero tactical input from you, the player. What is the first rule of strategy games? Positioning. Yeah, the game doesn't let you do that. It does that itself. It's super, super weird. If you press the attack button, you'll just move forward in the general direction of where your selected enemy is. You do not place your troops here. You either attack, which moves them forward, or retreat, which makes them piss off for a little bit. I think it's a bit hard to explain, and it was, initially, really off-putting. Again, making me ask the question, why? Why? But after playing for an hour, I actually quite liked it. It's quirky, but accessible. I mean, you don't need to think because it doesn't let you think, and I'm 33 years old. Thinking is overrated. You'll be going around recruiting lots of characters to your team, which again, just like Destiny of an Emperor, you have to go to a town to switch them all around. Thankfully in this one, it's not the end of the world if one of your team members faint. It's easy to get them back on their feet. Apparently, axe wounds do heal after a quick snooze. I like how, so far, each character does feel quite different. This is thanks to different skill attacks and different weapon types like bows, spears and swords. I don't know why Liao Hua has a shield, but uh, I'll take it. He protects his team like a proper dude. The random battles so far can be quite easy, so much so that I spent most of the time with those on the auto attack. But the bigger battles, that's where there's an actual enemy general, they can be really tough. Like, they are not afraid to hit hard if you're not prepared. I did have a few squeaky bum times against the biggest bosses. I also like the character designs. They are based on what we are familiar with, no doubt with huge nods to Koei's efforts to make these have recognizable faces, but there's also a nice anime twist to them. All in all, as I said, if you think Destiny of an Emperor is a bit of a cult classic, then I think you should play this. It's much better in the fact that it has modern sensibilities. I think it's surprisingly good. I didn't have big expectations of this, so maybe that's why, and uh, also me bigging it up, maybe you'll be disappointed, but I do think it is worth a look. The visuals seem like a sticking point, it's hard to get over that hurdle, but I promise you it looks much worse in screenshots compared to when you're playing it. I barely noticed it. I mean, it's a Super Nintendo game, right guys? Yes. And by the way, if you want to get this physically, it's available to buy on the Nintendo Switch. It was a Play Asia exclusive. There's a standard edition and maybe there's some collector's editions left. If you want it physically to keep forever, check the links below. If you purchase with that link, you can support me. I just want to give a quick mention to River City Saga Three Kingdoms. I'm not going to spend an overly long time on this since I reviewed it for Switch Watch a couple of years ago, and I'm not a fan of repeating myself, especially on longer form stuff. Well, unless it's making a joke about anime babes and flamethrowers, then I say let that record keep skipping. So actually, I'm just going to repeat my review, ha ha ha, but uh, I'll make it so I'm not dying of sunstroke. <laughs> yeah, that was a really rough summer for me. 
This is one of the more recent games in this list. It's a crazy match made in heaven. If you're unfamiliar with the River City series, it's a long, long running franchise from Arc System Works that most people think fondly of from the NES era. They were prolific, especially in Japan, but the West got River City Ransom, the Dodgeball one, great stuff, especially for the time, and I think they hold up well even to this day, which you can't say for most NES games, unless you're pushing 40 and I'm not quite there yet. Saga Three Kingdoms retains the gameplay that you may be familiar with, River City Ransom, but throws in the characters you know and love from each franchise into a washing machine and tumbles them together. For example, the series protagonist Kunio Kun is playing Guan Yu and is essentially the main character. Not sure why Liu Bei has been sidelined yet again. Not sure he would approve being shoved to the side, what with him being the eldest and, you know, becoming the actual emperor. That's definitely going to throw a spanner in the works of their relationship. It's all brotherly love until the big break only comes for one of them. Liu Hu, tell him he needs to make an appointment. Now, where's my hookers and cocaine? Once again, this begins right at the beginning. And it concerns the Yellow Turban Rebellion. This may be generic for some, but it's a game filled with personality. You can explore the environments in 3D, and there's a mix of safe towns and then highways filled with bandits or enemy troops. You can pop in shops, buy some meat buns or some classic lamb soup, which if it's anything like my experience in China contains one tiny slice of mutton and then a bucket full of spicy water. Apparently it's more about the dippage with the stale bread than the actual mutton soup that I actually ordered and actually paid for. You can buy weapons, you can buy special attacks and items to help you heal up, you can even talk with townsfolk for a bit for some humorous side talk. For the most part, Guan Yu will be roaming alone taking down the hordes, which he is capable of doing so, but for some of the bigger battles, you will be joined by Liu Bei and Zhang Fei, and maybe plenty of other allies too. The fight with Hua Xiong was a particular chaotic treat. There's obviously multiplayer and I did coerce my wife to play with me for about 20 minutes and we had fun. Although I will be paying for this later since I traded her help for a future browse of new bedsheets. Originally in that script, I made a joke about trying not to kill myself, which a couple of people took a uh, umbrage to. They said it was tasteless. But you know what is tasteless? That goddamn mutton soup. Also saying that I should appreciate my wife, I should appreciate the time we spend together, and that they wish they had someone to spend their life with like that looking at bedsheets. Well, I tell you, you don't know my wife. She would keep you there for three days without water and food. You would not survive. I t actually, you know what? If you have a drug problem or a drink problem and you need to go to a rehab clinic, no, just go to Ikea with my wife. You'll be licking the paint off the table trying to get some ethanol in your body. You will be detoxed by the time you get to the checkout till. And my wife, she does edit the audio for these videos. She does. She knows what I'm saying and she knows it's true. And I love you, but I don't love going shopping with you. You can play with four players in total, which is fun, although traversal can be a bit of a pain if people get too far ahead. Plus, there's often some difficult platforming sections which are fun, but the game isn't exactly equipped for, especially with multiplayer. It's overall a really fun game. It's your classic gameplay that still works well to this day with some modern twists and additions that make it more snazzy. It's a lot more interesting than your standard beat-em-up style gameplay thanks to its RPG elements, the exploration, and not-so-serious story. One of the big issues with this game, and pretty much with every game in this video, is that it doesn't see the story to the end. Once again, you're only getting about halfway through, which is fair enough. The first half is definitely more action-packed and crazy with twists and turns. When you get to the actual Three Kingdoms part, things tend to chill out a little bit. But it would be nice for these Three Kingdoms games to actually get to the Three Kingdoms parts. As you can see, there is a physical release of this, and if you want it to, you can check the link below to see where to purchase it, and you can support me too. This physical version, with English, is only available in Asia. There's no Western physical at the time of making this, and considering the time that's passed, probably never will. But the one linked below will play on any Nintendo Switch and play in English. There is also a Japanese release, but don't get that one since there's no English there. Trust me, with the link, and support me at the same time. We support each other, yeah? Now, we can't talk about Three Kingdoms video games without talking about one of the biggest releases in the past decade or so. It's a game I've been very, very reluctant to talk about purely for the fact it's a PC game at heart, and I've almost never been a PC gamer outside of Football Manager. 
I didn't get a PC until like 2005, and it was not capable of playing most games. So yeah, I have always been a console guy. Total War Three Kingdoms is an absolutely massive game with so many complexities, so many facets and talking points that need genuine time and expertise to assess that some idiot online could make a three hour video about it by itself. Don't worry, I will leave that to some other idiot because this idiot ain't qualified. In fact, I almost considered not including this game at all, but I don't think that would fly with most people. So please consider this more of a cursory glance at the game rather than anything too in depth because I am not equipped to deal with Total War fans who are like waiting like a hungry dog waiting to eviscerate me. Yeah, they'd even resort to cannibalism just to make their point and you gotta respect that. Total War, oh man, I remember being massively jealous about this series. When Rome Total War came out, I looked on jealously wishing I could play it. Creative Assembly are known for creating amazing historical empire simulators. They did the Romans, they did the short French guy, and some angry Japanese samurai. But I can't believe it took them so long to take on the Three Kingdoms era. Maybe it was too big even for them. Because unlike Koei, who have fun systems but can be accessible, Creative Assembly like to go all in with so many events, forces, and characters to cover Maybe it was too daunting. Or maybe Koei's just giving them the dead eye anytime it was brought up in a staff meeting. It's possible. But a couple of years ago, Total War Three Kingdoms did come out. And once again, I was quite jealous of the fact I couldn't really play it. At least not with the computer I had at the time. I have upgraded since then, but uh, I have a computer that's made for video editing and using private browsing function. Not really for games, but it manages just a little bit. So, Total War Three Kingdoms, where to even start with this beast? It's even harder after all these years, what with all the impenetrable DLC things going on. Can we just give it a rest, guys? DLC kind of annoys me unless it's for a rhythm game. Just finish the game and give me the game. Transaction complete. Nowadays, you need to have some sort of on-off relationship with a game. Like, just look at the screen. The character selection screen is bewildering in and of itself. And I am aware, I am a prime time PC idiot. Don't you worry about that. But still, where do I look? This is a game with so much depth and so much work put into the systems that it's perhaps one of the most unwelcoming games of all time. Although some PC strategist fans may be happy about that. This is the kind of game you need to spend 20 hours just to get used to everything, where everything is, what everything does. I swear to God, NASA's ground control computers have less things to look at than this. It's terrifying to a newcomer, but in the same breath, it's absolutely tantalizing because Romance of the Three Kingdoms, for all its wonder, you can't say it has anywhere near the depth as these games. If you need something to lose your life to, this is it. If you are a uni student and you're looking for the game that's going to make you fail your degree, we found it. In fact, you probably need a degree in this damn game to be able to work out what everything does and how to play it in an efficient way. Yes, I apologize for the shortness of this segment, but it's literally like putting a chimp in front of a PC instead of me. It's the same effect. I kind of almost don't want to learn the ins and the outs because, you know, I have a marriage that's going pretty swell. I have a daughter I enjoy seeing. I would rather not ruin that because I can see this absolutely sucking me in. It reminds me that I should get a proper mouse. Trackpads don't work so well for this one, which was especially annoying during the actual proper battle. I only did the tutorial or intro battle for Tao Tao, and it would be amazingly cool if I could control it as well as I would like. So after that, I used the auto battle feature against the yellow turban remnants. Why are they still hanging around? But it's not all about war because there is politics in here that plays a major part of the game as well. You have so many options in terms of not just alliances, also trade agreements, non-aggression packs, armies passing through territories. It goes on. The one thing, the one thing that has me worried early on is about your vassal's happiness. Any game where you have to manage your underling's happiness has me worried. Like Football Manager, like, oh my god, I didn't play you in one game and now you want to move somewhere else. Or when I introduced you to the press for the first time, I said one tiny inconsequential thing, probably praising you, and now you're having a big flap about it. 
anytime there's happiness in games like this, it's never realistic. And even though I've only played this for a little bit, I can see it. I can see that creeping in. Like, dude, your entire family, your entire livelihood is at my behest and you're having a moan because I'm not letting you do too much. You're a moron. I can't let you do too much. What are you complaining about? You're fine. You're sitting on your ass. You're not getting murdered in this civil war. Be happy about it. What I'm trying to say is loyalty in these games. Fine. Loyalty. I get it. Happiness. Happiness. We are in the greatest, deadliest, bloodiest civil war in human history and you're feeling a little bit sad. Oh, go have a cry and make a TikTok about it. I might slaughter your family, but hey, you might get 300 new followers. It's hard for me to know what to praise and what to criticize because I would just end up embarrassing myself. But I can definitely praise the presentation, the visuals for what it needs are fantastic. The intro is great, style great, the character artwork really nice, and it's good seeing this style of character artwork that's not immediately inspired by Koei's artwork. I mean, Tao Tao doesn't look like what you'd expect from three decades of Koei. He's very much normal looking warlord number 23. And that's fine. Just because they were ruthless dictators or inspiring heroes doesn't mean they need to look like Gary Oldman. It's fine to look like a dumpy ass bottle merchant. And with that thought, there we have it. A small selection of Three Kingdoms video games. As I said, there are quite a few that I haven't covered because this is a huge cultural thing, not only in China, but Asia as a whole. It's right up there with the Sengoku period in Japan in terms of making games about it. Most haven't been well documented on this old English side of the internet. And also, a lot of them are total guffage. Mobile, online games with microtransactions you need to grind every day. Maybe I have missed one or two more reachable, commendable games. And if I did, please let me know which ones you would have liked to have seen. I would say that I'll put it in the next video, but I won't. This is it. We're done with the Three Kingdoms. But I would like to thank my Patreon supporters for believing in me. Not only do they get these videos early, ad free but they get loads of other stuff as well like behind the scenes videos they get to vote in the producer role they get access to a secret discord for smaller updates plus they get access to a smaller bonus video for every big video i make for this video we're talking about mystic heroes on the playstation 2 if you would like to join them please check the links below visit patreon.com slash a bit more Jordan. You can watch that video right now and you can watch all the other good stuff on there as well. If you're not, subscribe, leave a like and a comment. That's supposed to help, right? If you're extra special, if you're like a super duper whooper person, an absolute legend of the highest order, leave a mahjong emoji in the comments in honor of the Chinese themes in this episode. What's next? Well, it's going to be a bit of a musical number. Don't worry, I'm not going to painfully embarrass myself like every old school YouTuber by thinking they're talented enough to make a musical. But no, I'm talking about a musical video game. Rhapsody. All of them. A big shout out to my super producers. Alexander Cato, Brent McLean, FF14 Best RPG, V, Sven Nowlitz, Wixit, Josh Foote, and Dustin Martin.